for a very short period of my life. I want to say it was around the time I was the age of 15 or 16. I lived in a fairly small house in Vermont. My family didn't live there long. It was located in the forest and far from almost everything, making any task that required leaving the house pretty inconvenient. However, there's one experience I had at that house in the time I lived there that I'll likely never forget. It happened in January. I only remember that because I can recall New Year's Day being just a few days earlier. My cousin Jason and I were both still on school break at the time and had planned to spend the night at my place. And this was something we would often do. We would typically stay up till 2 or 3 a.m. playing Xbox, watching movies, or something along those lines. This would all happen in the living room. This night, we had been watching a movie. I don't remember what movie it was, but that's not important. What I do remember is being maybe halfway through the movie when Jason kept looking out the window, just slightly to the right of where we were sitting. It got to the point where, like every minute, I could see his head move out of the corner of my eye. Now, I should mention, on that night, there was a fairly bad snowstorm happening. At first, I just thought he had been watching the snowfall until I realized just how long he had been staring out the window for. I asked him what he was looking at. He kept staring and responded saying how he thought he saw something. This instantly filled me with anxiety. I think this was mostly due to where we lived. Wild animals weren't all that common, and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't really live near anything. So someone on our property, especially at this hour and during a snowstorm, would 100% be cause for concern. Nothing happened for a couple minutes. I kept asking follow-up questions, but he just told me to be quiet, like as if to be able to focus. That's when we saw it. The clear shadow of a person sprinting from one tree to the next. Both of us physically jumped in reaction. There was no sound, but the sheer sight alone was enough to startle us. Now, this was a good 200 feet out from the house, so we couldn't exactly tell if the person was coming closer or not. We both looked at each other and right back out the window, I guess as a way to confirm what we just saw. A couple minutes of this went by, when it happened again, but this time much further to the left of where the first sighting had occurred. Slowly over time, the sightings would become more frequent. It was clear by this point that there was more than just one person. Eventually, one of the figures got out from behind a tree, but this time, instead of moving behind another one, it just stood there. And after a couple seconds, the figure started sprinting in our direction. This was enough to break us out of our sort of trance of disbelief we were in and run. I ran straight upstairs to wake up my dad. But by the time he got up and followed me downstairs, there was no one visible outside. Jason and I both explained to him what we had seen. Typically, I don't think my dad would have believed us, but I guess he was able to see the genuine panic in our eyes. We all went around the house, verifying all the doors and windows were locked. My dad then went outside armed with a weapon. He briefly walked around the house before returning inside, but he found nothing. That night, we convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us. Come morning, and the snowstorm had almost completely stopped. We went outside to better assess the situation in the daylight, and we would find multiple sets of footprints in the snow next to the trees facing our living room's window. They were pretty filled in from the snowstorm, but still clearly visible and recognizable as footprints. There were even some around the house, like on top of the footprints my dad had made the night before. I even talked to my dad about it, and he said those had not been there when he went outside. Even more disturbing was how our shed had been left completely open with the only thing stolen being our knives we used for hunting. None of this, however, would be enough to get my dad to call the cops. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and I guess he just never saw calling 911 as an option. We moved out of that house two weeks later. Not because of the incident, rather, that just so happened to be when we had planned to move. I was extremely grateful for this. At least as far as I know, nothing happened in those two weeks. This whole experience still freaks me out to this day. Seeing firsthand multiple people on your isolated property in the middle of the night and during a snowstorm is straight out of a nightmare. And I do my best not to think about it. This all happened during the winter months of 2014. Around that time, my dad got a new job that required us to move. 
not a small move. It was a good nine hours away from the house I grew up in. We hired a moving truck, but we still had the task of getting our car down to the new house. This time of year also happened to be around the time I was learning to drive. I guess my dad thought nine hours on the highway would be good practice for me. So the plan was me and my dad would drive the car down to the new house, while my mom and my sisters would fly. I wasn't exactly looking forward to the drive. Not because of the time, I didn't really mind that part. I was more so worried about the blizzard my phone was showing we would hit halfway into our trip. Driving in the snow as a new driver is not something I really ever wanted to experience. My dad dismissed this though, telling me it wasn't that bad and for the most part would just feel the same as normal driving. Anyway, we left at around 3pm, so we were sent to get to the new house at around midnight. Come around 8pm, and yeah, we got hit by the blizzard. It was a lot more extreme than I had imagined it would be. Although, my dad must have trusted my inexperienced driving for whatever reason, as he never once said anything about him wanting to take over the wheel. So, I kept going. Eventually, my nightmare would come true. I lost control of the car, and we were sent sliding off the road and towards a line of trees. In the moment, I tried my best to avoid them, but the car slightly grazed one of them. Luckily, I don't think my dad was that mad. It's not like we hit a tree head on at full speed. We got out to assess the damage, and by some miracle, there was nothing but a slight scratch on the back passenger side door. I held back a laugh of genuine relief. Just then, I noticed a vehicle coming up the road with some extremely bright high beams on. As it got closer, it started honking, and continued doing so until it pulled up right next to us. The guy rolled down his window. I figured he was going to ask us if we needed help. But no, he looked at us and began some awkward small talk, completely ignoring the situation we were currently in. My dad just kind of looked at the dude and told him we didn't have time to talk and asked what he needed. The guy responded with something like, Oh, uh, I just noticed you dropped something about a mile back. I think it fell into your trunk. Now, we did have a few things in our trunk that we didn't send with the moving truck, but there was no way any of it could have fallen out. Or at least I thought. I looked at my dad and asked him if there was any way something could have fallen out. My dad started his response, but was interrupted by the man saying, Well, you must have, because I was right behind you. It's in my back seat here. Why don't you go ahead and get it so I can get out of here? I figured it couldn't hurt to look, just in case we actually had dropped something somehow. But right as I put my hand on the guy's backseat door handle, my dad abruptly yelled at me saying that we didn't lose anything and to get back in our car immediately. A few seconds of silence with my hand still on the door handle went by. Yelling was completely out of character for my dad, though I eventually listened to him and got back in our car. We drove off, with not another word being said by either us or the guy. I couldn't help but notice the extremely disturbing and almost angry face of the driver as we drove past him. Once we got a few miles down the road, my dad would apologize for yelling at me. I of course told him it was fine, just that I wasn't really expecting it. I will never forget what he said next. He said he felt like he had to, because while I was heading towards the guy's back door, through the window, he could just barely make out the silhouettes of two men waiting on the other side. He would further explain that by the looks of their movements as I was walking towards the door, upon opening the door, I would either be attacked, kidnapped, or worse. Hearing this was a complete shock to me, but to this day, I'm still glad my dad told me what he saw. It taught me at a young age that not everyone has the best intentions in this world. However, at the end of the day, we can't 100% confirm the guy had bad intentions, but I myself truly believe my dad's instincts were correct. The whole situation just didn't add up. Why would there have been two men waiting right at the door for me to open it? And on top of that, when we got to our new house, we were able to verify that nothing was missing from our trunk. Thinking about this whole experience still scares me, even today. This happened when I was 18. I had just finished up my first semester of college, and a couple friends I had met there planned to rent out a cabin on some lake over the weekend through Airbnb. They asked if I wanted to go, and I said yeah. I didn't really know much about the destination, but I decided I'd go regardless. 
I was done with finals and honestly felt like I could just use some solid time away from it all. So my two friends and I, who I'll just call Brad and Dustin, were set to leave. The cabin was about an hour away. When we arrived, we unpacked the stuff we brought for the weekend and got settled inside. The first night was honestly kind of creepy, at least for me, because the cabin was pretty remote. It was the only one on the lake, and as far as I'm concerned, it was the only one within miles of nothing but forest. I'm someone who's used to being in cities with lots of people, not quiet forests with the occasional howl of coyotes. Needless to say, it was for sure a scene I would have to get used to. But all things considered, the first night was completely fine. It was the second night where things took a turn. All throughout the second day, a blizzard took place outside. We didn't really plan for it. I guess none of us thought to check the weather before making the trip. I mean, you gotta remember, all three of us were only 18 at the time. So, not the brightest. Anyway, on the second night, Brad and I slept in our own bedrooms upstairs, while Dustin slept on a couch downstairs. I think it was around 2am when Dustin went upstairs and woke both of us up seeing how the outside motion light kept turning on and off again. Brad told him it was most likely just an animal activating it, or the light simply being activated by the motion of the falling snow. But what Dustin responded with was pretty terrifying. He explained how that's what he thought too, but after looking outside, he saw what he described as something resembling the shadow of a person at around 6 foot tall. This definitely freaked us out a bit, but Brad, who was still convinced it had to be an animal, said he would go downstairs to check it out. And so that's what he did. Meanwhile, Dustin and I stayed upstairs. A good three minutes went by, when a blood-curdling scream rang out downstairs. Dustin and I ran downstairs as fast as we could. Brad was lying on the floor and pointing at the living room window. We looked out the window but there was nothing. He practically screamed at us to go upstairs, and so the three of us did. The rooms in the cabin didn't have locks, so we resorted to barricading ourselves in one of the bedrooms. Brad quietly explained to us that when he got downstairs, he started by looking out all the kitchen windows, and when he didn't see anything, he made his way to the living room window. He pulled back the curtain, and at first saw nothing, but not nothing like an empty snowy forest. He literally saw pure black darkness. Confused, he cupped his hands to his eyes and got closer to the window. But that's when he realized it was a person blocking the view. He then screamed and fell back. Now, at this point, I hadn't seen anything myself. Don't get me wrong, I was still horrified. But in the back of my mind, I still wasn't ruling out the fact that they might have just been imagining things. Just then, the power cut out. It felt like my heart had completely stopped for at least 5 seconds. I was now hysterical at this point. All doubt I had in the sightings Brad and Dustin experienced instantly vanished. I genuinely felt like my life was over in that moment. We had no weapons, and worse yet, no phone service. All we could do was sit and wait until daylight. Fortunately, nothing further would occur in that time. Once the sun was up, we took down the barricade and all started getting our stuff. We had no intentions of staying there any longer than we needed to. It was still snowing, but luckily the vehicle we brought was good in the snow. Before we left, we took a quick survey of the outside area around the cabin. There were no footprints, but this was likely because they were filled in by the snow. This had to have been the case, as there were no footprints by the fuse box outside yet it was completely destroyed. It looked like it was smashed in multiple times by an axe. The sight of this was enough to get us to leave immediately. Later we tried contacting the Airbnb owner, but we got no response. I always thought this was weird. I mean, if your fuse box got completely destroyed, I'd imagine you'd want to talk to the people renting the cabin at the time. But no, not even a text back from the guy. I stayed friends with Brad and Dustin throughout the rest of college. We would talk about the experience from time to time, but for the most part we kept it to ourselves. We still don't know who was stalking us in the woods that night, or what their intentions were. When I was young, my parents moved around a lot. 
I must have attended ten different schools during my life. My dad was the kind of man who shouldn't have had kids. He wouldn't keep a steady job and forced my mother and later my aunt to work long hours to support our family, which included six kids. He was a schemer and always looking for an angle to work. My earliest memories were bar fights and my dad robbing my piggy bank while he was drunk in the middle of the night. My mom followed him like a god. To this day, I don't understand why. He was physically violent with her, and she stayed with him for over 20 years until all the kids had grown. I guess she stayed for us more than anything. The story actually begins when I was 10 years old. My dad outfitted an old school bus with bunks, and we traveled across the country from Utah to Indiana and finally to Kentucky, where the bus engine died. So the bus was our home for a long time, until Dad finally rented what could only be described as a shack on the side of a mountain. This was near Burksville, in what is known as the Cumberland Gap. Very mountainous with steep hills, with gravel roads carved into the mountains. The house we rented was from an old man named Howard, who owned a gas station and convenience store where two roads intersected. Howard was a good old man who took a liking to my dad. He used to give us the flat sodas from his gas station when we were waiting on the bus. For us, it was a very rare treat to drink anything more than water. There were six of us kids altogether. Marty, who was just a baby. Michael, who was in kindergarten. My sisters Jean and Carol Ann, who were in third. And my brother Jim, who was in the second grade. I was the oldest in fourth grade. We would walk down a steep gravel road that was about a quarter of a mile from the house each day to the bus stop. I remember the gravel road was overgrown and had old houses that were dilapidated on both sides. The town had been part of the company housing for a coal mine that closed up back in the 50s. Kudzu and vines covered houses. Old trucks and cars that were no more than rust piles lined the sides of the road looking out of the brush as if they were trying to hide. Howard called it the Coal Mine Road. The house we lived in was at the top of the hill from the gas station, then about a quarter mile down Coal Mine Road on the right. It was the only house not grown over with kudzu and weeds. The road kept going to a clearing where Howard had an oil rig. I remember there were copperhead snakes, and we'd keep ourselves at the center of the road so no one would get snake bit. Sometimes they would come out onto the gravel and warm in the sun, especially early in the morning. We would throw gravel at them to keep them back. We were warned never to venture off the path because Howard had told us that there were hidden dangers all around. Old cellars that had caved in, uncovered wells, and of course, the snakes. Mom was very careful to keep us all near or in the house as much as she could. But being the oldest boy, I would be sent out to get coal from a coal pile. A potbelly stove was all we had for heat. It was a chance to goof off and look around, throwing old rocks at the windows of those old houses I could see through the woods. One day, Mama asked me to go out and bring in some coal. I was watching TV on a black and white TV set in the bedroom, and I didn't want to get up. So I acted like I didn't hear Mom ask. She finally came in the room fussing and said that if I didn't get the coal right now, it would be dark. So out I went. We had an old wheelbarrow that we used to bring the coal up to the house. Then we'd take a few large pieces in and put them beside the stove. For those of you who don't know, coal is very dirty, and it gets all over you. The old wheelbarrow had a steel wheel that needed grease and would squeal as you pushed it down the road and over to a pile of coal that Howard had brought out for us to keep warm. In a lot of ways, I think Howard worried about us in that old drafty house. This was sort of his way of helping. It was already dark when I shoveled the last of the coal into the wheelbarrow and turned toward the house. Then, I saw something. 
On the road past our home, there was a light. It was dim like an old lantern. Dad wasn't home, that I knew. He was working at a blue jean factory four hours away, and he wouldn't be home until Friday. The light bobbed as it came slowly up the road, like someone walking. There was nothing down that road now. No reason for anyone to be coming up from the old oil rig and coal mine, and if it was Howard, he would have taken his truck instead of walking. And yet here it was, a dim yellow light that seemed to keep a steady pace toward me. I gave the wheelbarrow a push. Then I stopped. If they didn't know I was here now, that would have told them. I dropped the handles of the wheelbarrow and made a run for the house, hoping I could beat the lantern carrier. As I ran the 100 yards or so to the house, the lantern grew closer, but kept its steady pace, not pausing. I could see it was a lamp, flickering with a very dirty, dusty glass cover. I could make out a single person in the light of the lamp as it swung at the end of the arm, walking ever closer to me and my home. I burst through the door of the house and yelled, Mama, there's someone out there on the road, behind the house. Mom came out of the kitchen and came to a halt just inside the living room. There was no doubt based on my face that I'd seen something. I wasn't overly afraid of the dark, and Mom knew that. I didn't spook easily, and she knew I was usually the one who got rid of the snakes and defended the younger kids from bullies. She said in a calm voice, Lock the door. I ran back to the front door and shut it quickly, not taking time to look for the lantern. I turned the old deadbolt lock and a homemade wooden lock we had made with a nail and a flat piece of wood. Mom came into the living room with a single 16-gauge shotgun. Her dad gave her that gun, and that may be the only reason we still had it, because she refused to let dad sell it. By this time, the other kids were coming into the room. She told them in a hushed voice to go to the bedroom and lock the door. It must have been the tone of her voice, because they did exactly that. I could hear Marty crying behind the door and my oldest sister hushing him. She walked around cutting off lights, the kitchen, the hall where the potbelly stove was, the living room. The house had those old string lights to a single bulb. So as each light went out, the house grew very dark. The only light was the light of the porch light and the light from under the bedroom door. Mama began to peek out the windows. First, she looked out the kitchen window. The back door was locked, I could see. She peeked out the small window in the door then and then the living room windows, then the bathroom. Nothing. She turns to me and asks, Are you sure you saw someone? I answered quickly, Yes, they had a lantern and were walking up the road. From the mine? She was looking at me intently with a furrowed brow now, her voice raised like she was questioning the information. You better be telling me the truth, she responded flatly rechecking each window. I was hurt and at the same time angered by her lack of belief. I then started checking the windows myself, but I didn't see anything either. Finally, Mom opens the front door and steps out on the porch. She goes to the edge and looks up and down the road. I peeked out from behind her and didn't see anything either. The moon was above the trees now and you could see clearly there wasn't anyone on the road. I guess it would be easy enough to turn off the lantern and slip into the woods, but why? We didn't have any kind of flashlight, so we had to just strain our eyes and see what we could. Nothing moved. No noises came from the woods, but we could hear the other kids bumping around in the bedroom. We went back inside and shut the door. She put the shotgun in the corner by the door and looked at me with surprising compassion after such a scare. Maybe we have enough coal for the night. She smiled at me. I really saw something, Mama. I once again insisted. Maybe it was Howard. We'll ask him in the morning. She walked back to the kitchen, leaving me standing by the door. 
The next morning, I woke to a very cold house. No one else was up, but the fire had burned down to cinders, and there wasn't any more coal in the house. I got up, slid on my pants and shoes. I went to the front door and saw the shotgun was still in the corner by the door, where Mama had left it the night before. I peeked out the living room window. Everything that had happened the night before returning fresh to my memory. Unlocking the front door, I opened it and I looked outside. My mouth dropped open. The wheelbarrow filled with the coal I'd loaded the night before was now just sitting on the porch. Someone had taken the wheelbarrow to the house and up the five steps to the porch without anyone hearing it. One more thing. Sitting on top of the coal was an old kerosene lantern. I poked my head out into the brisk air. I thought it was cold in the house until that frosty October morning met my bare arms and face. I looked up and down the old road and around the house, no sign of anyone. I brought in a couple of pieces of coal and started up the fire. We never did find out who my mystery helper was. We found out later that day that Howard had been out of town at a doctor's office in Versailles, and Dad didn't come home until later that Saturday afternoon. Howard said it looked like one of the old lanterns in an old storage shed near the entrance of the mine. Dad, Howard, and I walked out the road the next day. I remember I had a hard time keeping up, it was so grown over. Howard toted an old black revolver, and Dad had Mom's shotgun. First, we went to the old shed. The door was bolted, and the padlock was rusted beyond opening. We then traipsed through the tall weeds and kudzu until dark, checking each of the old houses. But they were all still boarded up. There were no signs of entry, except for some broken-out windows that were probably from my rocks. From that day forward, I went out early to get the coal, with the exception of a few really cold nights. Those nights I did venture out after dark, I took my lantern. About five years ago, when I was 16, I was living in western Pennsylvania in a heavily forested area. On this particular night, I was home alone with my younger brother, while my mom was out at a baby shower. I was in the kitchen making dinner for myself when I heard a knocking on the front porch, this wasn't a common knock, like someone might be waiting for me to open the door. It was more like a few loud taps close to one of the front windows. I paused and glanced around. From where I stood in the kitchen, I could see the front door and one of the front windows. All the lights on the ground floor were on, and with it being dark outside, all I could see in the windows was a reflection of the inside of my living room. I waited for a few moments, but when the sound didn't come again, I shrugged it off and continued concentrating on the stove. After maybe five minutes, long enough for me to forget about the sound, it repeated itself, this time from the front window at the far side of the house. Mark? I called out, thinking it might have been my brother. There was no response. I walked over to the front of the house and peered outside with my hands pressed to the side of my face, but I couldn't see anything. I turned as my brother came down the stairs. Did you just hear something from around back? He said. I held up a finger to indicate that we should pause and listen, and almost on cue, we heard footsteps calmly walking across the wooden floor of our wraparound porch, just outside the dining room wall. There's someone out there, I said quietly, more angry than scared. It was at this point that we should have locked all the doors and called out the window that we were calling the cops, but I was a stupid headstrong kid and pissed off that someone was messing with us. I remember my brother asking if the person outside was trying to distract us, but I was already at the gun cabinet. I should point out that I was raised with guns, and I knew how to properly handle one. I pulled out the 9mm from the drawer and loaded it. I'm going to scare him off, I told my brother. Lock the front door behind me. Before I could even give him a chance to argue, I was marching to the door with a gun in my hands. I threw open the door and stepped out into the porch. My brother then flicked on the outside lights, and right there, about eight feet in front of me, was a sickly thin guy wearing a hoodie with light blue eyes and a soul patch on his chin. 
He had been in the process of stepping onto the porch, but the moment he saw me, he spun around and ran like a bat out of hell. I took off running a few yards after him, then stopped, pointed my gun in the air, and fired off a shot. That's right, fuck off! I cried out. I waited until he disappeared into the trees before turning around to face the house. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that for a few moments my heart stopped. I felt that momentary wave of ice water through my veins, and the painful thudding of my heart in my chest as it tried to correct its rhythm. There was at least eight other people standing around my porch, and a handful more scattered around the yard. They were mostly men, but there was also at least two women all dressed in dark jackets and hoodies, looking mostly like they were in their early 20s. None of them said anything. Instead, they all just stared at me, their hands mostly in their pockets, and I couldn't tell if any of them had weapons. Then they all just scattered. Some jogged away, but most of them just walked off in different directions out into the woods. I legitimately forgot for a handful of seconds that I was holding a gun until I raised my hands to my face and felt its weight. I sprinted back to the front door and pounded on it until my brother let me back in. I had no idea what to tell him. I had just fired a gun up into the air and none of them had cried out or made any sound whatsoever. Had they had been drunk or something and were trying to pull a prank, they would have said something. They would have been like, Whoa, sorry man, wrong house, put down the gun. But all they did was just look at me, like I had just ruined their surprise attack, and more disappointed than scared. They all just wandered off. I had no idea what to make of it. My brother turned on all the lights in the house and called the cops, who to their credit arrived within 10 minutes and swept the perimeter. There were footprints everywhere, and they asked my brother and I numerous times if we had just had a party. I kept telling them a dozen or more people had just been loitering around our house in the darkness, but the cops didn't seem to take it that seriously. They asked if the strangers had threatened us, and I had to admit that they didn't in any direct way. They confiscated the handgun after I told them that I fired off a round, but they eventually returned it. I have no idea to this day what those people were doing that night outside of our house. My brother suspects that they were part of some kind of cult, and maybe have been setting up to perform some kind of ritual, and maybe that we were set to be human sacrifices. I thought it more likely they intended to break in and rob us, but saw the gun and bailed. That doesn't explain the silence, though. None of them uttered so much as a sound as they looked at me and just, as if instructed by some signal, scattered all at once. I've read that during alleged UFO sightings, people can become hypnotized by lights that appear above them, and they wake up hours later in entirely new locations having no idea what happened or how they got there. I can't dismiss that kind of possibility. They all seem to be hypnotized. That group of people has never returned and I haven't even caught a glimpse of anyone I recognized from that night in town. We bought a dog not long after. Back when I was in high school, my brother and two cousins ventured out on a long hike through miles of empty forest wilderness behind our house. We had explored the woods plenty of times as kids, but this time we wanted to go deeper than we had ever gone before, with food, flashlights, and knapsacks and everything. Fully aware that we would probably be gone for several hours, and possibly might have to end up stopping and camping for a night. I did my best to mark a route for us using a map and compass. It was stupid. Four kids under the age of 17 thinking that we could safely travel that deep into the sticks without anything happening, but we were young and confident, and none of our parents tried to talk us out of it. I was the oldest and the largest. I carried the compass and most of the supplies, including the tents and water. My brother Joe carried the first aid kit and flashlights, while my cousins, Lily and Tom, split the food between them, and Lily carried the flare gun. We only had one shot to use, and assumed that would be enough. We walked the majority of the day without incident, and after a few hours, we spotted in the distance a wooden structure sticking up out of a tree line. Uncertain of what it was, we made for it, deciding that that was where we should set up camp. The sun was just starting to set by the time we reached it, and it turned out to be a very old overlooked tower probably for spotting forest fires. We estimated that it was probably 60 or 70 feet high, but it would be perilous to climb. The staircase was a single winding path that wound up the perimeter of the tower, without any support beams. 
We dropped our bags at the base of the stairs and debated on how high we should climb. Lily and I wanted to make for the top, but Joe and Tom didn't trust the stairs, worried that they could give way beneath us. Lily and I made our way up slowly, placing one careful foot in front of the other. When I was about halfway up, a rotted plank broke from beneath me, and my whole leg sank down through the wet wood. I came down at an odd angle and bent my right leg. I cried out and pulled my left leg through the hole as I sank down to sit carefully on the stairs. Tom and Joe heard my cry and started up the stairs, and Lily in turn started back down, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but we were all panicking kids. When the others got to me, I immediately started insisting that I was okay, and that we all couldn't be up here this high on this weak staircase, and we should start heading back down. Joe was the first to reach the bottom when he stopped, pointed towards a nearby tree, and yelled, Hey you! We all looked. There was someone standing by a tree just looking at us. We couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, but the figure was extremely lanky with a ridiculous amount of gray hair and wearing an ancient jacket and jumpsuit. It looked like they had been just peeled off from the bottom of a dumpster. The four of us froze, and we all just stared. None of us knew what to say as the figure just stared at us. Then the stranger came towards the stairs. We freaked out and all scampered as fast as we could, right back up the stairs towards the platform. I stalked about two-thirds of the way up and looked back. The person was going through our bags at the base of the stairs. I then yelled, Get the fuck out of there! While the others tried to open the trap door at the top of the stairs. The figure looked up at me and called out something that I couldn't understand. I'm not sure if it was because the others were making so much noise right above me or because a stranger wasn't speaking English. It was a very high-pitched voice, so I assumed at that point it was a woman. I pulled out a small pocket knife and sat there, waiting for her to follow us up. She didn't. She sat at the base of the stairs, ate our food, and pocketed most of our things. When it became full dark out, she was still sitting there, and we were all unsure of what to do. We couldn't get up onto the platform, and we couldn't see enough to know if it was safe enough to climb down. I know what you might be thinking. You chicken shits, just go down and grab her. And that very thought crossed my mind several times during the night. But without flashlights, and given the fact that I was injured, I didn't want to risk it. She could have had a weapon on her for all I knew. She most definitely had access to the flare gun. Not that it would have helped us much if we had it. With the platform above us, we couldn't fire it straight up to signal for help. By the time first light of dawn peeked through the trees, I was stiff, very hungry, and sore. Joe, Tom, and Lily spent a sleepless night trying to remain quiet and not shift their weight very often. The figure down below was gone. We limped to the bottom of the stairs. We grabbed what possessions we had left, and Tom and Joe helped me hobble back home on one leg. It was the longest 14 hours of my life, from when I hurt my leg on the stairs to the moment I sank down in agony on my couch at home and took off my boots. To this day, I still have no idea who that woman was, most likely some homeless weirdo hiding out in the forest where no one could bother her. We also didn't know why the trap door wouldn't open. Tom presented the idea that someone may have locked it from atop the platform, not sure how that would work. As miserable as this experience was, we all made it back shaken and exhausted, and other than my hurt ankle, we were all unscathed. It didn't occur to me until much later that hurting my leg may have saved us all. What if we had camped on the ground that night, and while we were all asleep, the strange woman had crept into our camp? I think it could have been a whole lot worse. This is one of those experiences that sticks with you regardless of how much time passes. The kind that you make sure you tell your friends and family when reminiscing about scary experiences. This took place during my high school days back in 2008. Starting high school wasn't exactly the best time in my life. I despised the politics of the high school microcosm, and I didn't get along with most of the students or the teachers. I was kind of an outcast. I decided that I was through with school because I saw it as nothing but a toxic environment and a waste of my time. This naturally didn't go over well with my parents, 
My mother is a school teacher, so I would have to hear those lectures about how education is the foundation for the rest of your life, blah blah blah. Looking back from where I am now, I can agree. But I was an impulsive teenager with a lack of common sense. After about a year, I enrolled in an alternate school called Moore Mickens, which was a place of sanctuary for pregnant teenagers and dropout rejects like myself. They offered me the opportunity to obtain a high school diploma and a special program that would allow me to graduate a year earlier than what I was supposed to. I was originally class of 2011, but with this program I was now officially class of 2010. Shave a year off my sentence? Sign me up. I went through the process of being enrolled, and before I knew it I was hopping on the bus for my first day of my sophomore junior year. I couldn't help but bask in the admiration of flunking my freshman year and yet was still one step ahead of my former classmates. When I arrived, it was basically back to square one for me. I was surrounded by young women in various stages of pregnancy, and young men with time in juvenile hall under their belts. Needless to say, I didn't exactly fit in with the crowd, so I sat alone in the cafeteria during breakfast and stared off into space, speaking to no one. Until this dude I recognized walked through the lunchroom doors, his name was George, and he was one of the very few people I actually talked to at my previous high school. We weren't exactly close friends or anything, but he was the only person I knew at Moore Mickens. It turns out we were pretty much in the same boat. I waved him over and we made small talk and reconnected. Later that day, my sister offered to pick me up from school, so after classes were over, I went outside to the parking lot to wait for her. George had someone picking him up as well, so we got to talking again. How was your day, man? It sucked. I hear you, man. People are so fucking stupid. I wish I could just kill them all. Um, yeah, sure. I'm serious. I would totally bring a gun to mow them all down. I fucking hate people. Yeah, um, sure. Hey, there's my sister. I'll catch you later. George went silent and gave me a blank stare as I quickly made my way to the car. Now you're probably wondering why that conversation didn't raise any red flags, but I had about a million things on my mind. So I brushed off the morbid conversation as just bitter adolescent talk. The next day the class schedule alternated, and George and I ended up having the same art class. On a side note, the art teacher and I were cool, because she would let me draw pictures of skulls and zombies and stuff instead of doing the lame ass work she assigned. Anyway, I was sitting at a table with George and two other guys. The two dudes were talking to each other, and I was drawing this sweet picture of Iron Maiden's The Trooper. George suddenly got up and walked over to the classroom door and ripped down a map of the school that was taped to the wall next to the door. He brought it back to the table and proceeded to mark on it with a red pen. One of the other guys asked him what he was doing. You'll see. Everyone will. Even then, I didn't think too much of it even though I remembered the conversation we had at the parking lot. You have to understand that George seemed to get off on the uncomfortable attention he got being vague and creepy, and this school was meant to be a place for outcasts. I figured he was just imagining some fucked up fantasy or something. A couple of days after that, I was walking to art class again, but just before I entered, the door opened and a police officer left the room escorting George away, followed by the principal. I froze in genuine shock and dread, and all I could think was, oh shit. George was staring right at me with cold eyes as he passed, and I had to look away. Turns out, I wasn't the only person he hinted to about his twisted aspirations. The school was full of young parents after all, and apparently they took his behavior as more of a threat than I did, and in retrospect, I don't blame them. They found some stuff on his MySpace page that alluded to some sort of plot to shoot up the school. Here in Florida, threats like that are taken very seriously, even if it is just some fucked up teenager spouting some bullshit because he hates his life. It turns out the police found more than 28 firearms at his home, although to be fair they were all registered to George's grandfather and were kept in a locked gun cabinet. Though I suppose getting access to the guns wouldn't have been too difficult for someone like him. Thankfully, George was taken away, and nothing ever came of his plans. Sadly, more Mickens was shut down a few years ago. Aside from this incident, I ended up having some pretty good times there. I got my act together, and ended up graduating in the class of 2010. 
I can't say for sure if George would have gone through with it, but I'll never forget the cold certainty behind what he said that day in art class. You'll see. Everyone will. Number 1 My brother had a creepy experience with a house during his time in Japan. He sent me an email of the story. Instead of rewording everything he says and giving it to you in a third person perspective, plus I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste it and let you read it. Hey, I don't mind you posting about the house. Just don't put my name or anything like that. Don't put yours either. And don't go to any chat rooms or Skype ever. Chat roulette doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You're still just a kid to me. Anyways, here it goes. I'll try to remember the best I can. I guess it all began when my friend Jesse started dating this Japanese girl named Chi. We were talking about watching a movie about a haunted house, and Chi didn't want to watch it. She said she knew of a real haunted house. She told us about the house on the cliffside in a dead forest. I know what you're thinking, not the suicide forest. She just meant all the animals there were dead or something like that, so we basically convinced her to take us there. Just me and Jesse at this point. She takes us on a drive that ends in the middle of nowhere, and next to a trail in the woods. There was a little chain tied to two trees that wasn't doing much to keep people out, since it was dropped to about ankle height. All we had to do was step over it to enter the trail. Chi told us that she was staying in the car, and nothing we did could convince her otherwise. So me and Jesse head down the trail, and walk for about 10 minutes, until we got to the point in the forest where everything got silent. It's not like it was loud before. I didn't even notice the noises like the sound of crickets, birds, buzzing of insects and things like that. When it becomes completely silent, it just hits you. There are no animals in that part of the woods. Me and Jesse just took one look at each other and we both read each other's minds. We turned around and ran. We ran without stopping the whole way back. I didn't hear anything, but it just felt like something was chasing us. I beat Jesse to the end, and was almost in the car when I heard a thump and yell. I turned and saw Jesse on the ground. The chain rope that was ankle height had somehow caught him in the stomach. It left a mark and everything. I had to help him up, and we got out of there. But fuck that, we were getting to the bottom of this shit. So we got four more guys together, brought flashlights and guns and went back. It was scarier in the dark, but with the other guys, we felt safe. We made it all the way to the end of the path this time. We knew that we were coming up on something near the water, because we could hear waves crashing against the cliff. Sure enough, when we got to the clearing, we were on the edge of a cliff. We were all facing a little house that looked like no one lived in it for at least 10 years. We went inside and found that it looked like the family that lived there just disappeared. All of their belongings were tossed everywhere, but that could have been from people ransacking the place. I'm not sure. But it looked like clothes, dishes, and furniture were still there, just left behind and forgotten. The most alarming thing though, and the first thing you noticed was the walls. The fucking walls. Every inch of the walls and every room was covered in ash, not just like painted in ashes either. It was covered in words written in ash in some weird language. Latin if I had to guess. It looked like someone dipped their finger in ash, then started at where the wall met the ceiling, and began writing something. Then when they got to the end of that wall, they made a new line right underneath. It continued until the wall met the floor, and they went to the top of the next wall. I can't imagine how much time that took. The creepiest thing is that Jesse told me that he asked Chi in private what she had heard about that house, and she told him that the legend says a mom who lived there went crazy one day and killed her husband and four children. She turned herself in and said she killed them and burned their bones. The bodies were never found, and the lady spent the rest of her life locked up in some asylum. It makes me wonder, though, about all that ash. How much ash would it take to cover your walls if you burned five bodies? Would that be enough? I don't know. Crazy shit. Anyways, I won't be able to sleep after thinking about it. Next time you send me an email, 
Ask me about sunshine and rainbows. Number two. When I was 12, my parents and I moved to another state. The house they chose was built in the 1960s by an architect who designed it himself. It was in the shape of a T, with the stem of the T being the large master bedroom. My bedroom being in the furthest left of the T, with also two living rooms separated by a kitchen also in the top of the T. The way to the front door of the house was to actually walk past a beautiful stained glass window that took up the entire east wall of my parents' bedroom and into the crook of the T on the right side. Needless to say, it was a weird house. It also had a basement. The basement had a deep freezer room, an office, and an incredibly creepy crawl space that opened up into a giant cavern of dirt piles as far as you could see with a flashlight. That pretty much made up the underbelly of the whole house. In the backyard was a giant slab of concrete that looked like it had been haphazardly added, apparently to fill in a pool. Now I was 12, but I wasn't an idiot. This house was not child friendly, and it was incredibly weird. It didn't help that my bedroom was so far away, and this house was so old and bizarre that if I yelled in my bedroom, you couldn't hear it from the other side of the house. Skip to night one in the new place. I hate it. I curled up in my little twin bed, trying to get used to the weird sounds and sights that the house has, and not really understanding why I was banished to this corner of the house where it was the coldest. The screen to one of my windows rushes in the wind from outside, and I take off running to my parents' bedroom. I slept in their bed that night. After a few nights of this, my parents finally decide I have to sleep in my own bed. No questions. I am given a little stuffed dog to keep me company who I named Sherlock. I was kind of worried about him discovering bones in the basement. Of course, I ended up taking off running back to my parents' bedroom and slept cuddled between two annoyed parents. Finally, my mom decides enough is enough. I can sleep in the room closest to the bedroom on a large chair. Now, this chair is right next to the basement door and also to the back door. I agree to sleep in the big chair because I have never been allowed to before. And also, it's as close as I can get to my parents' bedroom without getting them upset. I throw a million blankets in a pile and nest onto the chair for the night. Surprisingly, Sherlock and I do seem to fall asleep quickly. At some point in the night, I wake up to what sounds like footsteps on the basement stairs. And the basement door is open. I scream so loud that my dad comes running out. He slams the basement door so that he has a clear view of me trying to become part of the furniture. Why did you open this for? Are you trying to scare yourself? Dad, I didn't open the door. It was already open. At this point, my mom comes out to comfort me, but she doesn't seem at all calm. Her hands shake as she helps me get untangled from the blankets. She takes me to their bedroom and we fall asleep, albeit after a few bedtime stories. I wake back up to the sounds of more feet, this time on the carpet. I lie completely still and hope the noises stop. But then, I heard whispering. I nudge my mom and she just rolls back to her position. I then poke my dad's arm. Nothing. Mom! I whisper right into her ear. I then heard somebody whispering back at me from the dark. No. I scream loudly and clutch Sherlock to me, but neither of my parents moves. Something tries to grab my foot over top the blanket. I scream louder until my throat hurts. Both parents are still and breathing quietly. I stop screaming and listen, trying not to pant. I shake my mom. She is completely passed out. <laughs> Giggling comes from the door by the bathroom and I hear it creak open. The green clock numbers on the dresser glow against the door, so I can see it begin to move. As I remember it, the numbers actually start counting backwards, flipping slower and then faster and faster, until it was almost blinking. Two sunken eyes seem to glare at me from the corner, and I leap over my dad to the other side of the bed, 
The bedroom door is dead bolted. My parents did this to make me feel safer, but now there's no way out. I hear the door bump against the dresser and I panic. I grab something heavy, it was a box or a book, off my dad's nightstand, and I throw it at the stained glass window, and it bounces off. Something grabs my foot and pulls me under the bed, where I fight and scrape and hit at the soft leathery thing that is trying to hold me down. I feel sharp pains, and I hear snuffling like a runny nose, and there was a flurry of limbs, almost like a giant spider. I finally connect with something hard enough to get out from under the bed. I threw the object again at the window, finally shattering it, and I ran out through the front gate into the street. I run for a long time, making sure whatever it was wasn't behind me anymore. I then don't really remember what happened after that. My parents told me they later found me curled up on a bench at the elementary school about a half mile down the road. I had stained glass in my hair, a black eye, and my left arm was broken. I had numerous cuts and bruises around my ankles and neck. We moved out of that house as fast as possible, sleeping in a hotel until it was all packed up. The police believe I may have fought off an intruder who broke the stained glass wall to attack my parents. They had no other explanations to give me. The person I see for counseling says that as a child, I had to find something tangible to rebel against, since I was not happy about the move. The beautiful stained glass wall was the focal point of the house and was the easiest to fixate on, especially since my mother loved it and it was something really easy to destroy. The wounds I suffered were likely self-inflicted as I ran, possibly in a sleepwalking state, through the streets until I ended up at the school. However, when I asked my mom about that night, she said she was shaken too, because the basement door had a key lock on it and only my dad had the keys. They were in his nightstand that night, and she had made sure to lock it because she was afraid I might go explore in the basement and fall down the stairs. She really has no idea how it opened. To this day, I still have night terrors of that thing with its dark pits for eyes, grabbing at my ankles and pulling me under the king-sized bed. I still don't know how my parents didn't wake up through all of the screaming. My therapist says I must have dreamt it, but I didn't dream of the glass breaking. Surely they would have heard that. You know the worst time to have someone break up with you? Besides the occasional story of a runaway bride you read on Craigslist, I'm pretty sure that Valentine's is number one on the list. I never would have suspected that my boyfriend Caleb would actually dump me last year. Even though we had been going through some rough patches, I thought we had made it through. He hadn't given me any indication that things were going to take a turn for the worst. In fact, the week before Valentine's, he had already booked us a reservation at Red Lobster, gone out of his way to ask off for work, and told me he planned to really go all out to treat me. Then, early V-Day morning, I got a text that changed my whole world. He decided to dump me. Who does that? Is this like high school? I called him immediately to demand a response. It's just too much for me, Molly. I'm sorry. I should have told you sooner, he responded. He told me a bunch of reasons why he had this sudden revelation, but a lot of it sounded like bull. I knew Caleb. He always rambled like this when he was trying to hide the truth, and the more he talked, the angrier I became with him. Just tell me you didn't cheat, please. I swear if you did, I'm going to hurt myself, I said between bitter tears. I was experiencing an emotional roller coaster, but it was about to get worse from here. He promised that he hadn't cheated and insisted that I could still keep any gifts that he had sent, including the planned reservation. I know this is all very last minute, but I need space. I need to know where I'm going and what I'm doing with my life, Caleb told me. He promised that he would keep in touch, but I could already tell in his voice that it was over. I was devastated. Honestly, I can't remember the first thing I did. Maybe I smashed something expensive or went to the bathroom and vomited. I was still reeling and it felt like I couldn't make sense of the world around me. To be honest, I thought about self-harm. And to anyone out there who is ever going through this, please listen to me and realize no man is worth that. I'm so thankful I 
have had that epiphany and I hope others do too. And come to think of it, this harrowing experience might have actually been my wake-up call. As crazy as that sounds. But anyway, there I was, trying to find the strength to stand when one of my closest friends Felicia texted me and asked if she could come over. I needed a lifeline to cling to after this whirlwind of a morning so I told her to come immediately. When she got there I think I fell into her arms and burst into tears. She was shocked but listened as I told her about what Caleb had done to me. And then she had this brilliant idea for us to go get drunk off of our butts and it sounded exactly the kind of distraction I needed. Felicia has always been a good friend and I knew that if I went with her I was going to have a good time. I changed my clothes, put on makeup and blocked Caleb from my phone. All of it felt very empowering. We went down to the lobby and called for a taxi to take us downtown, ready to live it up. When the taxi got there I remember thinking that this day was turning out to be good after all. Felicia and I talked as the driver took us to what we thought was our destination. Felicia was extremely vocal about her disgust with Caleb and apparently all men. They always do this. Use us like playthings and get rid of us to move on to something newer and shinier, she said. I think I recall that the driver seemed tense whenever she talked like this, like it bothered him. I was so busy laughing or crying that I didn't pay it as much attention as I should have, and I also realized my memory is probably playing tricks with me because of how jarring the next thing that happened was. We were merging off of a highway to a street when Felicia made some joke about Caleb's prowess in bed when the driver abruptly sped up and we zoomed through a light. I remember being rattled and Felicia shouted to him to slow down. Instead, he just kept going, looking angry as a feral animal. What's your problem, man? She finally asked when he slammed on the brakes. I suddenly realized I didn't recognize the part of the city he had taken us to. Were we lost? Was something else going on? I can't tell you how much I wanted this to be a normal thing. Then he turned around and pointed a gun in our face. Shut up and give me your phones, he ordered. Felicia and I immediately complied. He grabbed our entire purses after he took our cell phones and then started to drive again. Felicia and I were frantically trying not to be scared for our lives, but this guy was wasting no time getting us out of town. At some point, we crossed a bridge and he tossed our purses and phones into the river below. Then he kept driving to the country. There were several times in the drive that I thought about jumping from the car. I didn't know how to tell Felicia what I was thinking though. We were both scared stiff by the sudden and surprising psycho driver that we didn't dare make a move. I think it was probably five by the time the taxi finally stopped. And we had arrived at what looked like a rental cabin. Stay here. The driver ordered as he got out and went to his trunk. I had literally no idea where we might be, but I used those few precious seconds to tell Felicia that we should make a run for it. If we work together, we can overpower him, I told her. And when he opened the door to his cab, I kicked him straight in the gut and shouted for Felicia to help me. She was right behind me and we tussled with this guy for what was probably only two minutes. Sometime during the scuffle, he dropped his gun and Felicia ran to grab it. As soon as she had it, she pointed it at the driver and demanded that he let me go. The way this dude was looking, the thought he might try something even crazier. But surprisingly, he complied and released me. Give us your keys, Felicia demanded. He dropped them into the grass near my feet and leaned down to pick them up while my friend kept the weapon on him. We're leaving now, she told the driver. Slowly, the two of us backed up toward the cab and just as Felicia was about to get in, the guy rushed towards us. I swung the keys in his face and made him fall backwards with a twist. Then, I leaned into the taxi and revved the engine. I shouted to Felicia to go and she got in the passenger side before tossing the gun out the window. I didn't want to think the nightmare was over until we got away from that cabin. And as we drove off, I could see the guy scrambling in vain to follow us. Neither of us spoke for a good 20 minutes. Then, when I think both of us had the chance to really calm down, I said, What. Just. Happened. Felicia had been going through the glove compartment and found a few clues. The guy had kept clippings of articles about 
weird white supremacy and BDSM, weird smut magazines and would look like a locket. When we got back into town, we gave it to the authorities and of course had to give statements as well. The whole thing honestly, truly felt wildly surreal. And I later found out that that guy had been wanted in a different state for apparent murder. I know a lot of people say they come face to face with a killer without realizing it and this was definitely, literally one of those times. It still scares me to think about it. I've been through therapy, but it's just so hard to get over how close I truly came to dying or potentially worse, all because my boyfriend decided to dump me. And I know it's not right to blame him. I wasn't thinking clearly and maybe Felicia and I were just at the wrong place at the wrong time, but it could have gone so much worse. I guess the reason I even mentioned Caleb again is because when I told him about the whole ordeal, he just brushed this off like it was nothing. I know it sounded a little unbelievable that we went through all of that, but the least he could have had a little sympathy. I still to this day don't know what was in our conversation in the back of that taxi that just truly triggered that guy. Maybe because we joked about man or something like that. Who knows? Maybe that was just his intention from the very beginning. I have no idea. It was definitely the strangest, scariest, and most terrifying Valentines I'd ever had. I hate telling this story, not only because of how traumatic it was for me, but because it shows my age. My therapist tells me I should learn to look for the positives in things, so the only way I really know how is by making light humor. This was the early 90s, and I was about 16 going on 17 working as a regular babysitter in our neighborhood. My parents had decided that the only way I was going to get a car would be if I was the one that saved up for the down payment. So every afternoon after school, I would tutor kids or watch babies. Whatever I could do to earn a few extra bucks. There was one couple, the Moors, that always paid exceptionally well. And on Valentine's Day, they had a special request for me to watch both their six-year-old and their ten-year-old so they could go enjoy a romantic evening together. We will be back by eight, they said, and gave me about $50 just for ordering pizza, renting movies, and whatever the kids wanted to do. I asked them both what they wanted, and they both chimed in with a request to go to the local video rental store. I knew that Blockbuster was not extremely far, but I insisted that I did not want to do that until I got confirmation from their mom. This being the age before everyone had cell phones, I had to look up the phone number in an actual phone book and call the restaurant they were at. Those two boys were so eager to hear a yes from their mom I thought they might explode from excitement. It took about 15 minutes for me to finally get in touch with their mom who seemed a little frazzled that the only reason I was calling was so that we could go to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's fine, just do not spend all their money. And nothing rated R, she responded. When I told them, both boys squealed and ran to get their jackets. We left the house before it got dark and made it to the rental store in less than 10 minutes. Not surprisingly, it was empty save for the cashier and maybe one or two other customers. Go and pick out whatever you want. I told them as I grabbed some candy bars and popcorn. The oldest came back, first with a VHS of some Disney sequel, and asked if this was okay. I told him yes, and then asked where his brother was, only for him to be surprised that I did not know. Both of us went down the aisles looking for him, and for a split second I got scared thinking he decided to play some terrible prank and ran off. Finally though, I saw him standing near the edge of an aisle talking to a tall, lanky man wearing a trench coat. As soon as I saw this guy, I got a weird vibe and grabbed the younger boy's hand. Sorry, I hope he wasn't bothering you, I nervously told the stranger. He smelled funny, as if he had not taken a bath in a while. He had this weird, crazy look in his eyes that told me he was trouble. I just had a feeling. I desperately wanted to be wrong about it, so I yanked the kid away and berated him as we made our way towards the cashier. What were you telling him anyway? I asked. Just that we were renting some movies and that we were home alone, the kid said innocently. I couldn't tell you why, but alarm bells did not go off in my brain right away. But I guess I was too busy paying for the movies and dragging them out of the store. When we were walking back toward the house, it finally registered what he told me. 
Did the man ask you if you were alone? I asked. My heart was starting to beat a little faster, but I did not want the kids to think I was worried. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw someone following us. Yeah, he seemed friendly, asked a lot of questions about me, the younger boy responded. I picked up the pace and told them we need to hurry back to their house. I was positive now that we were being followed. I remember I looked back several times to see where this man was, but every time, it felt like it was just barely out of sight. He was a master of stealth. Once I was inside their house, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I chided the kid for being so stupid. Don't ever talk to strangers. That man could have done some serious harm to you. I remember thinking I should punish them by having them go to bed early, but I had no idea how right I would be about that. I glanced out the windows to see if I could spot him, and calming down, I went ahead and let them pick a movie. I was also trying to convince myself my paranoia had just been that. Less than 10 minutes later, we were watching the Angels in the Outfield movie. I heard a knock at the door, and that made me realize maybe I had not been cautious enough. I went to the front and peeked through the blinds, curious to see that no one was outside. My heart was pounding now as I thought I saw the man in the trench coat standing over near the bushes. I immediately told the boys to pull the blinds closed and then to turn off the lights. Next, I started to hear this stranger banging on the windows with what sounded like a stick. Was he just trying to frighten us? If so, he was doing a stellar job because I was terrified. Turn off the TV for now. Let's go to the bedroom, I said. I remember that the Moors had a house phone up in their master suite, so I was calmly trying to herd the kids there as this wacko kept rattling against the outside of the house. These kids were quite scared now, especially the youngest. He was crying. Be quiet. Don't be scared, I told him. As we ran up to the bedroom, I told them both to stay as quiet as they could as I reached for the phone, only to find the line was disconnected. This is the moment when a real sense of panic and dread was starting to overwhelm me. It was just past 6.30, meaning their parents would not be home for at least another 45 minutes, and now the phone lines are down. I was positive that this stranger was going to try and break in and do his harm. Still, I insisted that they needed to remain quiet and calm. I got the older one to assist me in moving furniture to the front door as a blockade, just in case this guy broke in. It is a good thing I did, because 20 minutes later, I heard the shattering of glass and realized... That's, that's exactly what he planned to do. I told them both not to make a sound as I tried to listen where the stranger was. The one thing about the whole experience I will never forget is that the stranger started to whistle for us like he was looking for a dog. It was loud and sharp. It was an insistent whistle and he kept saying, Here boy, here boy, come here boy. I swear I've never been more scared in my life and I ordered the boys to hide under the bed as the footsteps came up the stairs. I was sure we were about to die. It happened just like a horror movie too. He was standing outside the door because I could see the silhouette of his shadow peeking under the master bedroom door. Then, the blockade of furniture started to rattle as I heard him fiddle with it. He shook it violently for a while, but to no success. Then another long, indescribably quiet moment. I thought maybe he had given up. The kids were trying their best not to squeal or scream or even cry, but it was so hard to be perfectly still. At any second, I knew he was going to be back. Then, he slammed his body against the door, and it came slightly ajar. I remember jumping and holding the boys closer as he did it again, and then again, until at last, he could squeeze in past the wedge furniture. All I could see was his shoes, leather boots that looked coated in mud. He walked slowly over to the bed and sat down, perhaps puzzling over where we were. He started whistling again, and I had to cover the younger boy's mouth as he let a leash fall over the ledge of the bed. Did he know where we were? What sort of weird fetish was this supposed to be? He walked around the room, moving to the closet first and checking for us there. Then we heard the garage door downstairs. I have never been so happy. Immediately, the stranger ran down and I heard shouts of alarm as Mr. Moore likely saw him escape. A few seconds later, Mrs. Moore was in the bedroom frantically searching for us and calling out for her children. I crawled out first and helped the youngest get out as she grabbed him and hugged him as tight as possible. Downstairs, Mr. Moore was trying to get the landline again to connect the cops, but it did not work. 
Honestly, I thought the crazy guy was going to come back and do us harm, so I did not even want to step outside the house until my own parents came to pick me up. Mr. Moore told me that I was very brave and paid me extra for helping keep his kids safe. My parents also told me I had acted swiftly and decisively, and it could have turned out a lot worse. But I did not feel immensely proud. I had trouble sleeping for a week or so after. Any sound of a dog barking or a whistle would trigger the memory and make me want to curl up in a ball and hide. I can honestly only share it now after all these years, thanks to a bit of therapy. Sometimes I do think about what could have happened. Still though, if those parents had not shown up early, he would have harmed us or probably killed us. The cops never did catch whoever that guy was, so I guess we will never know. Except at least I know I stopped babysitting for the upper class after that. This story took place during a difficult time for my family. My mother and father had just divorced and my mom was trying to get on her feet again as a newly single mother of two. My dad got into a bad accident and he almost didn't make it, so he couldn't do much to help my mom physically or financially. So my mom moved us from New York to Pennsylvania, a new state, but not terribly far away. This way my mom was closer to her work. My little sister and I were having a hard time with so many new changes, parents divorced, almost losing our father, living in a new place and starting a new school. We started to get a hang of things and soon it became easier. I started making new friends and it all seemed like it was going okay. I noticed this guy that would always follow me around the school. And if I'm being honest, I didn't mind. We'll call him Greg. Greg was very attractive and we began to talk a little. Not too much, just the normal what's your name kind of stuff. Soon I found myself having a small crush on him. It was totally based off of looks because again, we didn't talk much and we hardly knew each other. This is going to sound so stereotypical, but it's true. When I came home from school, I began feeling very watched. I didn't know by what or who, but I just couldn't shake the feeling. Then later on, Greg would mention small things. There would be no way of him knowing. For example, one night my mom asked me what I wanted for dinner and I told her my favorite, tacos. The next day he made a comment along the lines of, you like tacos, so do I. And at first I thought it was just a coincidence but then it became too many coincidences and I started to put it all together. So now comes Valentine's Day. We had to give everyone in our class Valentine's Day cards. I got all mine and never really looked at them until I got home. I got one from Greg. It was just the standard card with nothing special until I noticed I had got an extra card with no name and had a mushy love poem written on it, followed by, I love you and I'm watching. Instantly, I panicked, and at the same time, I sighed in relief. It's creepy someone wrote this and claimed to be watching, but it also validated I was right, and I wasn't being crazy or paranoid. I took out the card from Greg and compared it to the card with the poem. The handwriting didn't match, but I know if it were me doing this, I'd be smart enough to change my writing up. Still though, I had no proof it was this guy at this point, and I had to get creative. I thought to myself, Greg has to know I like him if he's really been watching me. I've talked about him to my sister and I've said how cute I thought he was and all of that. And that's when it hit me. Aha, I'll carry on like normal and bring up a conversation with my sister in a few days. And I'll mention another guy instead of him. If Greg says anything about it, then I'll know for sure it was him. So I waited a couple of days to have this conversation with my sister. So it wasn't so obvious I was baiting him. I picked out a guy that was pretty cute and believable, but also a guy that I've never spoken to or had any ties to. So no one could suspect anything going on with this guy without hearing it from me themselves. So I did it. I told my sister. Just like clockwork, Greg approached me. He sat next to me silently and art class started. We started drawing and then it happened. He looked at me dead in the face and said, I know you don't like me. You like Kevin. My heart dropped and I didn't have much to say other than, I don't even know Kevin. In my mind, I was even more freaked out and even more relieved to know it was definitely him. The story has a boring ending because after this, we moved back to New York. Thank God. 
I still stay in touch with some of my friends I made at that school, and a few weeks ago, I was catching up with one of them. She mentioned Greg and informed me that he had been arrested. Apparently, he beat his girlfriend, and beyond that, there was an investigation going on, and Greg was apparently charged with sexual assault. He said to me, Abby, did you have someone come over the last two nights? I replied, very confused. No, I haven't been home. She replied back something like, don't be scared to say it, but are you and the neighbor having an affair? I stop and think, and then I remember, the neighbor and Jacob look exactly alike in the dark. You could easily say one is the other. No, I'm not having an affair with a neighbor, but are you sure it was him? Did you see him go back to his house? My landlord said she never saw him go in my neighbor's house or mine. She's only seen the guy on Valentine's Day and the day after. I talked to my neighbor and I know it can't be him, as he told me he wasn't home. I didn't think it could be my neighbor because he and his wife give me hand-me-down clothes for my daughter from their daughter. So it must have been Jacob. What if I was there those nights? What would that have meant? So here's a tip to anyone who's going to leave another. Just do it because whatever told you to leave is probably right. To this day, I have no idea what he was planning, but Jacob, let's never meet again. Number four, my crazy obsessed friend, submitted by Moon. Before I really tell this story, I need to catch you up. This is the second time this has happened, but hopefully the last. This happened the same year I met Joe and all of this went down. My ex Matt had moved away, so I was single. It was Valentine's Day week and this was usually the time people start getting all lovey-dovey, but I don't care much for it, mainly because I find myself sick every Valentine's Day. There was this girl, let's call her Darla, because I want to respect her. Darla and I were pretty good friends we hung out and had a few classes together. She had previously told me she was gay and I respected that. Frankly, I was proud to be her friend. So what are you gonna do for Valentine's Day? She asked me. Jessica heard and knowing my Valentine's Day curse, she butted in. Probably be sick in bed all day and watch anime. People around us laughed, even me. But Darla didn't. She kept a straight face and kept staring at me. I was kind of creeped out but I didn't say anything and kept talking. But as Valentine's Day kept getting closer and closer, she would keep a better eye on me, constantly wanted to be around me. It must have been four or five days away from Valentine's when she sent me a message. Hey, are you awake? It was about midnight, but I happened to be awake. Yeah, what's up? Oh, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. I'm fine, it's 12, Darla, what did you need? Well, I love you, Moon, is what I remember. I did fall asleep, tired after waiting for a response for 30 minutes. The next day when I saw Darla, she ran at me and pushed me against the wall and screamed, Why didn't you answer? Jessica had to pull her off of me, but I couldn't believe what had just happened. I froze watching Darla scream at Jessica that I was hers and that no one else could touch me. After that, I ended up going home early. Randomly, I had gotten a text from Darla. She apologized to me for everything she did. I said it was fine and I forgave her, but over time, we just stopped talking. Our friendship faded into distant memory. One day, as I was on my way to church, I looked up from my phone to see a poster, one of those police missing people posters, but with Darla's picture. My heart sank. I had a friend who we can call Abby, I asked her what had happened to Darla because she still went to the same school as her. Apparently after I left, Darla became distant and soon she went missing. The negative people say she killed herself and others say she just ran away. After everything that happened, I can't help but feel that I was responsible. We're going back many, many years for this, but I grew up in Northern California in quite a poor rural area. Some of my best friends from elementary and middle school live like 10 to 15 miles away, so on weekends, instead of just going over to visit for the day, we'd have sleepovers to save our parents driving these crazy round trips. 
So I had this one friend called Star, whose parents were like old school hippies. Their house always smelled of patchouli. They were vegan before vegan was even really a thing, and aside from a few unusual recreational activities, they were basically just as good as being parents as any other couple. They were sweet, loving, and attentive, and I always had a ball whenever I went to sleepovers at their place, mainly because they'd let us stay outdoors in a tent at night, which was just such a huge adventure for a little group of preteen tomboys. Anyways, this one night we're staying in a tent in the backyard, but it was a backyard that extended to one side of the house. Where we're camped is in the view of the TV room window, so Star's mom and dad could keep an eye on us, but it also meant we could see the driveway from the flap of our tent. It was summertime, so it was still incredibly warm at night, so we ended up leaving the tent flat unzipped to let some cool air in. It obviously wasn't open all the way, because bugs, but we can still see outside the tent. Then, in the middle of the night, Star shakes me awake and whispers, There's someone in the driveway. I'm thinking it might have been her big brother, who was a few years older than us and was attending college, but when I suggested that, she said, No, it's a bunch of people, look. I start getting real anxious hearing that, so I quietly creep up to the tent flap to peek out, and that's when I saw that Star was exactly right. In the little bit of moonlight that we had, I literally lost count of the number of people I saw creeping up her driveway. It was seriously one of the scariest moments of my life, mainly because there was absolutely nothing to do but keep as quiet as possible. We couldn't call the cops, this was way before cell phones. We couldn't warn Star's parents without revealing our presence. We were just powerless, forced to watch people who obviously didn't have good intentions slowly approaching Star's house. I think in the end, Star just broke, and in a move you could either call real brave or real stupid, she just ran out of the tent shouting, Get away from my house, and then, Mom, Dad, call the cops. As soon as she starts screaming, a bunch of flashlights burst into life, obviously held by the guy sneaking up the driveway. And oh my god, there were so many of them. At first glance in the darkness, it looked no more than about five or six people, but when they all turned their flashlights on, it was clear the number was more like 15 or 20. I just hear, Sheriff's Department, show me your hands. And that was incredibly confusing because... We were all about calling the cops to get help, but like, the cops were already here? Anyway, Star does as she's told, while me and our friends start climbing out of the tent with our hands in the air. That's when the person approaching us started saying, Jesus, they're just kids, man. And with them being closer, I could see that they really were cops, with caps and badges and all patches on their arms, all that stuff. Then I hear, go, 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 get in there and the cops start bashing the front door to the house in while other cops fanned around the backyard and headed towards one of the barns. We were scared, obviously, but we're so focused on just staying down and watching that we're not really freaking out too bad. But when the cops start dragging Star's mom and dad out of the house and arresting them, she had to be restrained by the cop that was guarding us. After that, the cops drove me and our friend back to our respective homes, then... I don't know what they did with Star. I think they took her to her grandma's or her aunt's or whatever. Then a few days later, we find out that Star's mom and dad had been growing something they shouldn't have in one of their barns. I get that it was illegal and stuff, but the aftermath was just so sad. Star had to go live with her relatives because her parents were sent off to prison for a few years. It was messed up. And I get that the cops were just doing their job and stuff, but it was definitely one of the scariest times of my life, seeing all those figures in black just creeping towards my friend's house. So, back when I was a kid, me and my best bud were having a sleepover. His mom and dad had gotten a divorce a couple months prior, so to counter all the stress of it, he pretty much got whatever he wanted. Not like his mom was spoiling him or anything, she was just being super nice to make sure he wasn't too bummed about his dad leaving. Did it work? Yes and no. 
getting to have his friends sleep over, getting an Xbox, a cell phone, and getting much more personal freedom was all well and good, but every so often you could tell the whole thing was getting to him. The good thing was, I got to spend a whole bunch more time with him to give him the support we needed, which coincidentally meant that I was there for one of the worst moments of his childhood. Actually, make that both our childhoods. So, we're having a sleepover, and his mom is having a friend over. Or upstairs, they're downstairs. At one point, I wanted a glass of water, so I head downstairs, but he had to walk through the TV room to get to the kitchen, and when I do, I see my buddy's mom's friend is a dude, and they're getting kind of close, if you know what I'm saying. They jump off each other when I walk into the room. I walk through like, don't mind me, and it's incredibly awkward as I walk back through with my glass of water. Then, I make the mistake of mentioning it to my buddy. He's clearly not happy with the fact that it's a dude. Like, we're ninth graders at this point, so we're pretty savvy to, you know. Anyway, my buddy isn't happy, but he just does his usual thing of internalizing it before distracting himself. Not the best coping mechanism in hindsight, but it is what it is. Then, remember that cell phone I mentioned? Well, his mom bought it for him so he could keep in touch with his dad, which he then does. And guess what's the first thing he tells him? Yep, that there's a strange dude over at his house. I totally blame myself in the moment. It sucked so hard, and when my buddy hung up, turned to me with a smug grin and said, Dad's on his way over. I just knew something bad was going to happen. I kind of wanted to leave, but at the same time, my whole reason for being at that time was being a good friend to Ryan. I had a really healthy family life at home. Like my mom and dad were a loving, dedicated couple, right up until the day my dad passed. And I'd like to think they raised good kids. But Ryan, his parents were turtle morons. And good God, did that make me feel guilty. So, I stuck around. I knew something horrible was going to happen, but I had zero freaking clue to how bad it would really be. My buddy's bedroom window overlooked his driveway, so when his dad finally did show up, we could see and hear almost everything that went on down there. His dad, and I'm not embellishing here, hurdles up the driveway at like 40 miles an hour, screeches to a stop, and then doesn't even shut his door when he climbed out of his car. Ryan is watching him, looking at him like his dad is a knight in shining armor for a few seconds, right up until he says, Ah, oh, crap. I think my dad has a gun. Hearing that final word sent this razor-sharp icicle running right through my guts. I knew there'd probably be shouting and fighting, but... Shooting? Then all we hear through an open window is... Where is he? It was Ryan's dad. He'd banged on the door until his mom answered, and then demanded to know where her guy friend was. Ryan's mom's all like, I don't know what you're talking about. But then Ryan's dad goes from zero to a hundred in a second flat. Don't lie to me, Linda, where is he? He says. There's this very real, palpable pause, and me and Ryan are just on this very tense, nervous feeling, then... His mom says, Who told you? Again, shiver of ice through my stomach, because I'm basically the one who told, and in that moment, I told myself that whatever was about to happen was completely my fault. See? Ryan's dad exploded at the admission. You're a freaking liar, Linda. Now get out of my way. We could hear Ryan's mom screaming for a second. Then we heard another voice only this one is definitely inside the house. The guy friend. Get off! He screamed. You heard the guy start to shout something at Ryan's dad. Then he just went totally silent, and all you could hear were feet beating against the floorboards downstairs. All before, bam, bam, bam. Three distinct gunshots that echoed around the house. Me and Ryan are just bawling at this point because we could still hear his mom screaming and we had no idea if she'd been shot, if the boyfriend was dead, if the boyfriend had a gun and fired at Ryan's dad. The whole situation was traumatic enough, but the not knowing, man, that was just the worst. 
I had to grab Ryan's cell phone off of him to call 911. He just totally shut down from the stress. He'd had a rough enough few months while the whole divorce thing went on, but now he had to deal with potentially a dead mom or dad. I don't blame him honestly. It was bad enough for me and it wasn't even any of my parents. The three shots were all heard and before the cops showed up, the only sounds we could hear were Ryan's mom crying downstairs. We should have gone to check on her. I know we should have, but the dispatcher told us both to stay put because we didn't know if there was still an active shooter or whatever, so we did as we were told. Thankfully, everyone turned out to be okay and no one was even shot. Ryan's dad had aimed the gun at his mom's friend as, as soon as he'd laid eyes on him, but the guy was quick and just bolted out the back of the house as Ryan's dad pursued. He fired three shots, but it was basically just to scare the guy away at that point, and I heard none of the bullets even went near him. But still, it was terrifying, and Ryan's dad ended up going back to prison for a long while because of it. I remember going to my first ever sleepover in fourth grade. The nighttime was great. We played Nintendo, made a Ford out of the couch cushions in his TV room, everything a kid could dream of. We went to bed way later than usual, told spooky stories while we shined flashlights at the ceiling. It was every part the Norman Rockwell cliche. Right up until the next morning. We wake up bright and early. He heads out to the bathroom, but when he does... I hear his mom whispering something to him in the hallway outside his bedroom. Then, he comes back in and really somberly says, My mom says you gotta go home. Naturally, I ask why, but he shrugs and tells me my mom is already on the way to give me a ride. As you can guess, we were real sad about it, but we'd had a whole bunch of fun the night before, and even kids know that the good times gotta come to an end sometime. Anyway... My mom shows up, I say bye to my friend Mikey and his mom, but I notice that his dad isn't around. He'd been there the night before and he was a really cool guy, so I asked them to tell him I said bye and thank you so he didn't think I was rude or anything. Mikey said sure, but his mom just kind of looked off into the distance and stayed silent. I thought that was kind of weird, but it was really early in the morning so I didn't think much of it. But I definitely noticed how the really fun, warm atmosphere of the night before had been replaced by something much colder. Then, when I got into my mom's car, she too was acting like something terrible had happened. I might have been just nine, but I wasn't dumb, so I remember asking her what was going on, that I knew something weird had happened and I'd rather just know. So, she tells me. She tells me that... While me and my buddy were sleeping peacefully in our pillow fort, his dad had an aneurysm in the next room and was dead before anyone had woken up. It was bad. I know that seems like an understatement, but it was worse than I could have imagined. His mom pretty much fell apart and she and my friend left town shortly afterward to go live with relatives. It's something that haunted me for a long time, knowing I was so close to a death like that as well as seeing how a sudden death can just wreck someone's mental and physical health. Like the last time I saw his mom, she'd lost a whole bunch of weight, a complete shadow of her former self. My buddy looked pretty bad too, but he was definitely taking it much better than she was. That was the last time I saw either of them, when they came over to break the news that they were moving away. It sucked, and we promised to stay in touch, but I guess things don't always turn out the way you want them to. Way back when I first started middle school, it was in a different part of New Jersey, so I didn't really know anyone. I was terrified I wouldn't be able to make any new friends, so imagine my relief when I met Jenny. Jenny isn't her real name, and I'm not going to use any real names in this for reasons that will become obvious. So me and Jenny became fast friends, so we decided to have ourselves a little sleepover at her mom's place. 
Our parents talked it over and we arranged for me to go home with her on a Friday after school. Then my mom would come get me on the Saturday morning. The Friday arrives, I catch the bus back to Jenny's place with her, and this marks the first time I ever met Jenny's mom. She seemed weird, to say the least. Jenny's dad wasn't in the picture anymore and I don't think her mom took it very well because she was the kind of woman who was in the crystals and Reiki and all that other spiritual stuff. Maybe she was into that stuff before he left her. The point is, she was that kind of witchy woman, I guess you could say. The evening started off with Jenny's mom being quirky but nice, but at a certain point she started opening bottles of wine and drinking them super fast. Like even at 13 I'd recognize that there was something not right about the way she drank. But given I was spending most of my time in Jenny's room, I didn't think it'd really matter. Wrong. Because at one point Jenny's mom walks into her bedroom where we're hanging out and half collapses down onto the bed with a, what's you girls doing? I don't know if other people can relate to this, but I always used to find drunk adults to be really, really creepy. Seeing how something as simple as a drink could change them so much and not even for the better. Ugh, it made my skin crawl. But a scary story about, oh poor me, I don't like drunk people, that's not what you guys are here for. So I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that that's not the scary part. The scary part was when Jenny's mom started channeling spirits. It was legitimately one of the creepiest freaking things I'd ever seen. Seeing this grown woman trying to change her facial features and her voice to make out what the dead were talking through her. I knew it wasn't real. I was 13, not dumb, but seeing her like believe it was happening, it was honestly one of the most disturbing things I'd ever seen. She'd pretend to be some long dead murderer and talk about the murders they committed. Then she'd pretend to be a child cancer patient talking about how scary it was to die so young sick stuff like that. And we had to listen to her drone on for like an hour or so, telling us all kinds of things that 13-year-old girls should definitely not be hearing. Eventually, she tired herself out and passed out on Jenny's bed. She just excused her mom and we continued the sleepover in the TV room. I was mortified for her, but to Jenny, this was the most normal thing in the world. Then, about four or five months later, just before summer break, Jenny's mom suffered a complete nervous breakdown and tried to stab her with a bread knife. It was a whole thing in our town and I don't think I'd ever seen Jenny again. Thankfully, she did end up getting adopted by a distant cousin who lived a few towns over and so we still got to hang out every once in a while. But her mom was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and I know that had a really negative effect on her. Me and Jenny lost touch after high school but if she's out there and she just so happens to be reading this, I hope you're okay. I miss you and I hope you and your mom are doing just fine now. Back when I was a kid, I had this friend in elementary school. We were super close, sat next to each other in class, hung out every recess and lunch, so, at one point, we planned a little sleepover. My parents' place was kind of small at the time, but she lived in this big old house with her grandparents, so it was arranged we'd have our sleepover there instead. I never found out why she lived with them or where her parents were, but I distinctly remember my mom and dad telling me not to ask her questions about them for obvious reasons in hindsight. The only thing was, my friend seemed really, really set on having the sleepover at my place, I mean, to the point where, when we had no choice but to have it at her grandparents' place, she seemed to not want to have a sleepover anymore. I had to convince her to have it at her place just because I was so excited about the idea of having the sleepover in general. Anyways, it comes to the night of the sleepover, I go over to her grandparents' place and it's every bit as fun as I imagined. We watch movies up in her room, had pizza delivered, ate ice cream right out of the tub, and her grandparents seemed really sweet and nice. Then I think it was around 9pm. Her grandpa knocks on the door, pokes his head in and tells us that he and my friend's grandma are headed to bed, so we're to keep the noise down. We're like, 
Okay, good night. He leaves, and we carry on with our night. A little while after, I get up and head over to the door, telling my friend I needed to use the bathroom. She jumps up, throws herself between me and the door, and is like, You can't go out there. You'll wake up Grandpa. I tell her not to worry and that I'd creep down the hall on tippy toes so as not to wake him, but my friend still refuses to let me leave the room. I think she's actually playing around for a second and I'm like, quit it, and try to get past her, but she actually shoves me back away from the door with this angry look on her face. I didn't want to start a fight with her after all. The whole objective was to keep as quiet as possible, but still I needed to use the bathroom. So I asked her where I'm going to go, and get this. She reaches under her bed and pulls out one of the plastic stationary trays. You know, like the inbox and outbox kind you put paper in? Yeah, that kind. She points at this paper tray and is just like, go in this. Again, I think she might be playing a weird and cruel sort of trick on me, but she's deadly serious. She actually wanted me to pee in that stationary tray. So I did. It was super gross, but I did it, and instantly, the mood is just destroyed. I had nothing to clean myself up with. I'm pretty sure I peed a little on my nightgown. It was just all kinds of disgusting. But still, my friend won't let me go to use the bathroom to wash up. The weirdest thing was, she acted like it was normal. She never did anything like that at my house, and she definitely didn't seem like that kind of kid, like she wasn't known as the stinky kid in school or whatever. The whole thing just kind of blew my mind and although I didn't let it affect our relationship or friendship or anything, I definitely didn't like to stay over at her house again. We stayed close for a long time after but ended up going to different high schools because she moved in with her aunt over in St. Paul. We kept in touch using MySpace back when that was still a thing but I never got to the bottom of her weird nocturnal bathroom habits, not until well after her grandpa passed away. When he died, she seemed to take it really bad. When I called her, she broke down crying so bad that she had to hang up and she wouldn't return any of my texts, no matter how much I begged her to get in touch. In the end, me and my mom looked up her aunt's home phone number and called ahead before we drove over. The aunt seemed more than happy to talk to us, but with the caveat that she had something very, very serious to tell us. My friend's grandpa had been doing stuff to her. Whenever her grandma was asleep, she got up to use the bathroom or whatever. Her grandpa would hear her come out of his room and... God, I can't even bring myself to say it. Turns out he'd done the exact same thing to her mom too and that's like half the reason she wasn't in the picture anymore. One of the other reasons was the drug use, which is why no matter how much she insisted on custody not being given to the grandparents, a judge ignored her and did it anyway. I think they were just so terrified of him that they just couldn't talk about it, ever, and it was only after he died that it all came spilling out in various forms. The aunt that she was living with was her mom's cousin, so obviously wasn't around for what was happening when they were kids. It was absolutely horrifying hearing about it just as her friend, so I can only imagine how terrible the aunt felt, knowing she was so close to the abuse but just not being able to see it. And then it all made sense to me, why she didn't want me walking down the hall at night, why she'd taken to peeing in a stationary tray that she kept hidden under her bed. She wasn't being mean or weird when she made me do it, she was protecting me. No wonder she didn't want me to have this sleepover in her place, and I'm really not trying to make this whole thing about me when I say this, but I feel horribly guilty for not saying anything to my parents at the time. I didn't want to embarrass her. She was my friend. My best friend. But that's just the thing about being a kid, isn't it? That naivety. You do dumb stuff, even if you don't mean to. And that's what my therapist tells me anyway, and I try to believe it. I really do. But part of me will forever remain convinced that somehow, but part of me will forever too. This is the story of my waking nightmare. 
Until about two weeks ago, I was employed as the head mental health counselor at a major university here in the UK. My job mostly consisted of coordinating sessions between counselors and students, although for two days a week I'd personally run sessions on a face-to-face -face basis with some of the more vulnerable students. Even in light of what's happened recently, I find my job extremely rewarding. Being a young person in a high-pressure environment such as university can take a very heavy toll on their mental health, and the fact that I've been able to guide so many of them to calmer waters is something I'll always be extremely grateful for. It's not always easy. My career has definitely had some ups and downs, but since hitting my 30s, I definitely feel like I've come into my stride. The fruit of this has obviously been my promotions, as I went from junior to senior advisor, and then a team leader in the space of just 18 months. I felt like I was running an effective, caring and professional operation, but beginning about three weeks ago, my entire life came crashing down around me in a truly devastating fashion. Like I said, I can't refer to anyone by name, so I'll use the name Amy to refer to the student in question. Amy was a first year who'd contacted our team in early February, saying she was having a hard time coping following a breakup back home. I'm sure you can imagine how many of those we get on a yearly basis, and the vast majority are first-year girls like Amy. Generally speaking, a little empathy and gentle advice go a long, long way with young women in such predicaments. And although we try not to lean on the plenty more fish in the sea or no guilt for the guiltless cliches, the counseling of such a problem tends to be relatively simple and concise. I had no idea how difficult and dangerous Amy's counseling would be, but when one of my junior team members approached me with their own predicament, I was only too happy to assist them. It is, after all, in my very job description, that if a junior member of the counseling team is having trouble with a student, I step in to apply my experience and expertise. And when a junior team member was struggling with Amy, I relished the opportunity to build trust, apply leadership, and lessen their workload. But that proved to be one of the biggest mistakes of my life so far. My first session with Amy was fairly productive. We talked about her relationship, what it meant to her, and why it was difficult to move on from. I could understand why my colleague had such a hard time with her, as she was extremely emotional and very highly strung. My initial suspicion was that she was suffering from GAD, a general anxiety disorder. But before recommending any kind of formal psychiatrist appointment, which usually leads to prescription medication, I thought it would be best if we had one or two more sessions to see if we could resolve things in a healthy, non-prescription manner. Again, this was a huge, huge mistake. By the time the second session was over, I'd identified a few key issues that I believed Amy could work on in her own time. The first was that she seemed to absolve herself of any kind of personal responsibility, be it in her own now defunct relationship or in her home life. In short, every problem in her life was caused by someone else, even if she had to grasp for some abstract reason with which she could lay the blame. The second was that she refused to even entertain the idea that she might be able to identify any kind of solution on her own. In a lot of cases, answers are much more easily obtained within oneself. We generally don't need a library of self-help books or podcasts if we're brutally and sincerely honest with ourselves. This doesn't always mean the person themselves are at fault. For example, it might be that one has a detrimental person in their life who they refuse to leave behind. All you need is the self-awareness to identify that person, habit or behavior, than the bravery to deal with them. Since Amy seemed incapable of such introspection, I knew it was something that I'd have to bring up with her, and fast if we wanted to make quick progress. So for our third session, which just so happened to fall on the day after Valentine's Day, I put forward a few of my uncomfortable observations. Now as you can imagine, it's not nearly as simple as just telling the person, you have issues. This might sound obvious, but the idea with counseling is to actually counsel, not pass judgment, give direct treatment suggestions, or tell anyone what to do. The trick is to allow a person to come to a healthy conclusion on their own. This is just as true of counseling as it is of child rearing. A person must learn to be good voluntarily, 
not under duress. So, the way I usually approach something like that is to simply ask questions. Do you think you could do X, or can you see yourself doing Y? That sort of thing, simply worded, polite questions that provoke spontaneous thoughts and introspection. But when I put it to Amy that some of her problems might be of her own creation and that her inability to settle on a healthy coping mechanism was impeding any progress, she didn't take it very well at all. In fact, she not only saw zero merit to my polite suggestion, she took it as a direct, unsheathed insult. I know for a fact, with it being near Valentine's Day, her sense of loss was infinitely stronger than it was before, but it was still dismayingly surprising when Amy burst into tears, declaring that her visits to the university's counseling team had been counterproductive and a complete waste of time. Then, to my increasing concern, she seemed to enter a sharp downward spiral of negativity right there before my eyes. I tried my best to calm her down, told her to try the psychological breath technique, but none of it seemed to work. And suddenly, a mild jolt of horror went through me as she spat out the words of taking her own life. Despite the shock of hearing those terms thrown around so casually, I believe I'm fairly adept at dealing with threats of self-harm, and lo and behold, after a few careful minutes of sub-crisis management, Amy regained a degree of composure. Once her breathing was under control, she asked if she could use the office's restroom. Naturally, I showed her into the small restroom out in the common area, then told her she could return to my office whenever she was ready to continue the session. As I'm waiting for her, five minutes passes, then ten minutes passes, then, at 15, I actually thought she might have just walked out of the counseling office, having abandoned this session entirely. But the moment I walked out, Becky, the counseling office's secretary and also not her real name, shot me this puzzled look. She didn't leave the toilet, did she? I asked her. Becky just shook her head and in that instant, the flash of fear I'd felt before boiled up into full-blown terror. I started banging on the door, shouting Amy's name and telling her if she didn't open the door I'd call the fire brigade, paramedics, and anyone who could stop her from hurting herself. I rattled the doorknob, basically started punching the door, but no one said a word on the other side, and it gradually dawned on me that if I wanted to actually save this girl's life, I'd have to kick the door down myself. I'd never done anything like that in my life, and at five foot eight and nine and a half stone in weight, I don't think I'd actually be able to do it. Time and time again, I sent myself crashing into the solid oak, but it didn't so much as budge. At one point, I looked around to see Becky looking absolutely terrified, phone in hand, indicating she was already contacting emergency services. In the end, I didn't need to. The door swung open on its own, and when I saw the state Amy was in on the other side, I was almost propelled backwards in complete in utter astonishment. Amy was covered in blood. There was a large cut on her upper lip, one which had poured blood down her chin, neck, and chest. There was also visible bruising on her wrists and forearms, as well as a trickle of blood edging down from her hairline onto her eyebrows. I'm ashamed to say that the sight came with a sick sense of relief knowing that She'd just been hurting herself as opposed to actually taking her own life. I knew she was in a volatile state. I knew she was suffering a deep emotional pain. But I never, ever expected to hear the words that came out of her mouth. Ow! Stop hitting me! Please! I'm sorry! Ouch! Ow! As she screamed, I watched in absolute horror as Amy grabbed herself by the fleshy part of her forearm and began to squeeze. I instinctively backed off, hands in the air showing our similarly terrified secretary that I hadn't laid a finger on her. We both watched as Amy proceeded to throw herself into the heavy oak door, head first, and the impact was so forceful that Becky actually let out a cry of distress. She did it again, and again, and again, until I was forced to step in to physically restrain her. When I did so, she sunk her teeth into my arm so hard that I too let out a scream, and as I let her go, she tumbled into the arms of Becky and began weeping uncontrollably. 
I remember looking down at my arm and seeing the little flecks of blood that were forming in the indentations her teeth had left. Then, once Becky had assured me that the police were on their way, standing operating procedure in the event of a violent episode of self-harm, I retreated to my office to remove myself from the situation. It was a horrific day for me, without a doubt one of the worst in my practicing career, but again, I had no idea how bad things would really get. When the two uniform officers showed up at our offices, I felt this brief sensation of relief before I heard Amy giving her very distorted version of events. Not only did she claim that I'd attacked her in the office restroom, but she also claimed I'd violated her in the most violent manner possible. I was stunned into silence, and if it wasn't for Becky giving her side of the story, I think I'd have been under arrest right there and then. One of the officers had a very intense look about them as they quizzed me on my bite marks and like I said, if it hadn't been for Becky clarifying what had happened, I'd have been in a lot of trouble much sooner. As you can probably guess, the office restrooms aren't covered by cameras, and for obvious reasons, the camera in the reception area doesn't face them either. This proved a huge problem later on, but at the time, Becky's account was all I thought necessary. That was Monday, February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. On Tuesday, I was down at the city's central police station once again giving my version of events. The officer I spoke to seemed like he was on my side and that he understood Amy to be a very disturbed young woman, and for a while I think that was actually the case. On the Wednesday, I received a call telling me that there would be no further criminal investigation for the foreseeable future and that the investigating officers understood what had actually happened. I was also asked if I wanted to press charges against Amy for biting me and, as much as I declined on compassionate grounds, I was told the university was probably going to exclude her for making a false accusation, not to mention damaging university property. That decision was simply out of my hands and although it's not strictly how I'd have handled it, I appreciated their position. I believe that's what forced Amy's hand and motivated her to do what she did next, because her next move was to go public. The first I heard of it was when a colleague called me at about 1 o'clock on the Friday morning asking me if I had a Twitter account. I didn't, and I still don't, but that didn't mean I wasn't able to view the relevant tweets, tweets that featured a hashtag consisting of hashtag arrest and then my name next to it. There were literally hundreds of those tweets, maybe even thousands of them, many from students at our university, but also hundreds from people who had just jumped on the vindictive bandwagon. It was definitely disturbing to see, and I'd be lying if I said it didn't affect my sleep that night. But I honestly didn't understand the true implications of such a misinformation campaign until the coming weekend. By that time, there had already been a miniature protest outside of the counseling offices, and with an incredible amount of ire directed at me, I tried and failed to enter. The result was that the university's administration had sent me home early, then called later in the evening promising me paid leave until the turmoil could be smoothed over. That was the first nail in my coffin. To the people in the know, it was standard procedure, nothing more than a way of protecting a valued member of the faculty. But to the Twitter mob, that was the surest sign of guilt so far. I hadn't been given paid leave to manage my stress, I'd been suspended pending an arrest and a eventual guilty verdict. The tipping point was when Amy directed the mob at our secretary, Becky, whose sole testimony had kept me from being arrested. I kept in touch with her and although she initially promised to stick by me, I knew they got into her when she stopped answering my calls and texts. I don't know exactly how they threatened her or if the mob had found something to dangle over her head, but from what I heard, she spontaneously went to the police to change her official statement. After that, the case was reopened, and I was officially arrested for assault, and I honestly can't even bring myself to type it here. It's the part that really turned a horrific false accusation into the stuff of living nightmares. I'm simply incapable of that aspect of the crime, and I can't even get into the headspace of someone that would be psychologically able to do something like that. But one by one... My colleagues, my friends, even members of close family, I felt their opinions of me shift as the accusations began to mount, 
not just from Amy, but other members of the student body, and even a few local girls who I'd never even been in the same room with. When I tried to contact Becky again, when I tried to beg her to tell the truth about what happened that day, I was told that if I did it again, it would constitute witness intimidation. And that's where I'm up to. It's been almost a whole year and I still don't know whether this is actually going to trial or not. My solicitors think that once the mob's energy is properly died down and Becky is ready to come forward with the truth, then I'll be able to put this horrible chapter of my life behind me. I hope one day the truth of the matter will actually be re-established, but honestly, I don't know if that day will ever come. There's obviously the complete lack of DNA evidence and that's putting it as uncrewed a way as possible, but I still have my doubts. And the way people have shown a complete lack of regard for evidence and due process has been one of the most terrifying and depressing aspects of my experience so far. I know in my heart of hearts that even if you actually read this mess of a story to your followers, some of them will just decide I'm a liar. They'll decide that Amy's side of the story is weak and incoherent as it is is the actual truth. And that, to me anyway, is far more terrifying than any ghosts, monsters, or magic. I recently watched your Places with Scary Backstories video and most of it helped keep my mind off this whole torrid affair. But one story brought me right back to reality. The one about the Salem witch trials. Hundreds of years later, and the mob is still hunting witches. They still want to watch them burn. Just as the mob wants to watch me burn too. I went to university in London for about three years, and this happened in my final semester early on in 2018. The area that I lived in wasn't that great, to say the least. There were daily issues with catcalling, creepers taking photos of female students on their way to nights out on the weekends, and this wasn't even the first time that I'd been followed. It was just the worst. Often I would tell classmates stories about a creep that I encountered that day, and they'd ask what area I was staying in, and when I told them, they'd go. Ah, uh, yeah, that's why I don't go there. I should also mention first that I have pretty bad anxiety disorder, and this day I nearly didn't go into university at all because I just had a really bad feeling. But if I listened to every single bad feeling I got, I'd probably never leave the house. So I shrugged it off and decided to make myself go to class anyway. My anxiety is so bad at times that it's hard for me to differentiate between a genuinely bad feeling and my brain going into fight or flight mode for literally no dang reason. Knowing the issues of the area I lived in, I purposely dressed down as much as possible to minimize attention from creepers because I was in no state to deal with it that day. My typical look ventures into alternative style. Lots of black tattoos and dark makeup. You know, the works, which tends to get attention in itself, so on this day I purposely just wore jeans, a massively baggy shirt, and little to no makeup. I figured this would be enough for people to overlook me and just let me go about my day more or less ignored. Well, I was wrong. A piece of information that's really relevant to this is that there was a note emailed to all of the residents of my apartment block around this time. Apparently a man had recently attempted to assault a handful of girls from both our apartment block and another student hall apartment block around 10 minutes away. It also included a description of the man. Not even 5 minutes after leaving my apartment block, there's some guy following me. Now at first, alarm bells really didn't ring yet. It's pretty common for strangers to approach you in London, usually trying to sell something to you or just generally get money off of you in some way or another. So I hear this guy start calling after me. Hey, excuse me. But I keep my head down and flat out ignore him, which is usually enough to put off anybody trying to sell you something. Well, when he then starts following me down the street and across the road, I knew this was a bit more sinister now. He's getting progressively more frustrated the more that I ignore him. His excuse me's becoming more insistent and eventually turning into, Oh, come on, I'm just trying to talk to you. At this point, my heart is already racing like crazy, but I'm a big fan of true crime and I like to think I know the basics of trying to keep myself safe, specifically when it comes to not falling into the trap of being polite, even when somebody's making you uncomfortable. 
And just after I cross the road with this guy still following me, I come into a series of small shops. They're not so small as to not have any security. Just the kind of place the people working in the area would stop by to grab their lunch for the day and so on. Thinking of both the security guard and the security cameras, I walked straight into the shop, hoping that this would be enough to put the creeper off. Well, it's not. I go into the first aisle and pull my phone out, texting my dad to call me immediately. There's not much he can really do as he lives across the country, but I figured that maybe even seeing me on the phone will put him off, or that maybe I could say something like, So you'll be here in five minutes? Okay, great. Hell, I mean, worst case scenario, I figured if something happened, I at least had some form of witness on the phone. My dad, knowing of the problems that I've had with creepers in the area, calls me immediately. We have a code for if I'm being followed so that I can tell him without being too conspicuous about it. But I'm way too panicked to care about being subtle. The creeper is now standing a couple of feet down the aisle, pretending to look at things, but mostly just staring at me. All the while he had his hood up, obscuring most of his face, which made me really uneasy. It was as if he was just as aware of the security cameras as I was. He matched parts of the description of the man that we'd been emailed about, but it was really hard to tell with his hood up, and he was also wearing a really thick pair of sunglasses which hadn't been mentioned in the description. As they were the most noticeable thing about him to me, I wasn't really sure if it was the same guy. When he realizes what I'm doing, he then disappears from the aisle, but I'm cautious and stay standing where I am. I was shaking and pretending to be fascinated by the bottle of Pepsi that was in my hand. All the while my dad tries to juggle comforting me, asking me questions, and giving me advice on what to do. Not even a full minute passes by before suddenly the creeper then reappears and with a box of donuts in his hands. I turn to him and snap a, what? Doing my best to make it clear that I have absolutely no patience for him. He proceeds to ask me if he can borrow 20 pounds for the donuts. I give him an annoyed look and reply with an impatient no doing really all that I can to try to make my 5'3 self appear at least somewhat intimidating. He does his best to appear hurt and offended, giving a, Oh, sorry I bothered you, before putting down the donuts and then walking away in the general direction of the exit. Again, I'm not convinced. I stand in that aisle for a little while longer, telling my dad what had just happened and then move over into the next one, slowly scouting out the entire shop for any sign of him. I'm standing in the third aisle now when he then reappears yet again, slowly edging his way towards me. There's only one other person in the aisle, a shop employee that was stacking shelves, and I'm mustering up the courage to approach the worker and try to explain my problem when the creeper tries to talk to me yet again. Putting all of my adrenaline to use, I spin to face him and then snap out a, What? What do you want from me? Keeping in mind all of the anti-creeper advice that I'd seen online about making it obvious that you would not want to be an easy victim in the slightest. And he seemed surprised by this, before mumbling out something along the lines of, I was just wondering if, uh... But I honestly couldn't make out exactly what he was trying to say over the sound of my damn heartbeat. So I look at him and then say sternly, Go away, just leave me alone. To which he then returns to his shock and offended act, then saying, God, okay, I was just trying to be nice here. Which I respond to with, Well, don't. And then he storms back down the aisle. I walk through the shop another three or four times to make sure he was really gone this time. All the while still on the phone with my dad before I finally check out and then peek out of the shop entrance. He's still hanging around and I have to choose a moment where he seems distracted by something so that I can haul my ass out of there immediately. I really needed to get towards the tube station. At this point, I was an absolute nervous wreck, and the only reason I didn't go straight back home was that I was absolutely scared that he would follow me. The entrance to my apartment block was in what can only be described as an alleyway. It was a spruced up alleyway which often had fellow students or workers from the area on their smoke break, but it was significantly quieter than the route to the tube station. I figured I'd just continue on my way to university, which would at least get me out of the neighborhood for a few hours. Plus, it also gave me the chance to see my friends and get some in-person comfort over what had just happened. My dad stayed on the phone with me right up until I was on my train, and I was looking over my shoulder the entire time, expecting to see the creeper follow me again. 
Now, I can see how this might have sounded like my anxiety blowing things out of proportion if this was my last encounter with the creep, but it wasn't. The following week on the day of that same class, class was canceled, so I spent the day in my flat generally being just an antisocial hermit. The week after, however, same day of the week, same time of the day, I was leaving again to go to class, certain that the encounter two weeks ago was just another charming story to add to my collection of gross encounters from the area, when not even five feet from the door of the apartment building, somebody falls into step with me. It's really not too unusual. With other students in the building, I figured it's just somebody who had a class at the same time as mine making their own way to the tube station. And that's when I hear, Hey, do you remember me? I look up and I can't even manage to keep the dread from my face when I then see the creeper from two weeks ago. Right away, I tell him to go away, remembering how it worked the last time, but not this time. This time he doesn't even attempt his shocked offended act that he played in the shop, and instead even seems amused by this. He instead then says, I'm just walking this way too. So I halt in my steps and just gesture forward, then saying, Go on then. Figuring if he's telling the truth he'll keep walking and continue on ahead of me. Well, he doesn't. Instead, he just stops and smiles. It was that same freaking amused sinister smile as before. And then he says, Come on, why won't you talk to me? Which I then respond to with, Just leave me alone already. But I'm getting more and more freaked out by this creep and it doesn't come out anywhere near as harsh as I wanted it to. He then does that creepy smile yet again. At this point I start walking again, knowing that when I turn the upcoming corner we'll be facing a music venue which pretty much always has either security or some kind of janitor right outside. Figuring I can just go up to them and ask them for help if he doesn't leave me alone. He keeps trying to talk to me. Do you have a boyfriend? I'm tempted to say yes, hoping it'd get him to leave me alone, but I know that it'd more than likely just probably lead to even more questions. How long have you been together? What's his name? And probably just a bunch of other creepy invasive questions from there. This guy doesn't even care if I have a boyfriend or not. He's just trying to draw me into conversation. Every time he tries to swerve a little, so he's now walking parallel to me, just closer. I take a few steps away. I start to get more nervous and respond to that question with, Oh, screw off! But he just keeps firing questions like, Why don't you talk to me? I just want to talk to you. Don't you like talking to people? But by now we're rounding the corner and I now spot a security officer. I immediately pick up my pace, going down a set of stairs that led towards nothing but the security guy so that it's obvious what my intentions are. The creeper quickly says, I'll just leave you alone then. You clearly don't want to be friends. He then disappears and I speed walk down the street to the shop that he'd followed me the first time. It's only when I'm outside the shop that I decide to stop and look around. He's nowhere to be seen. If he really had just happened to be walking in the same direction, I would have still been able to see him because there's literally nowhere else to go from where I was walking. Which meant for me to not be able to see him, he'd have to have done a U-turn and started walking in a completely different direction altogether. After much pleading from my family and friends, who were really worried that this creep would show up again the following week since this was two separate occasions on the same time at the same day, I went to the reception staff at my student halls. I told them about the incident and they put me in touch with the police to make a report about it since they thought it was the guy who we'd been emailed about. The police were, well, nowhere near as helpful. In fact, they didn't even get back in touch with me after I emailed them an entire account of what happened. The following week, my dad drove down from across the UK to walk me to class, with no sighting of the creeper, and for the rest of the semester I left over an hour earlier than usual for that class and just hung around campus to waste time. The silver lining was that this whole thing really made me appreciate my family because they ended up memorizing my entire schedule, always making sure that I had a relative available to stay on the phone with me from the moment I stepped out of the flat to the moment that I was on my train and vice versa. I honestly thought that was the end of the entire thing, until a few months later. I was now graduated and moved back to my hometown when I then get a text from my best friend. It's a link to a news article about some pervert who had been in court for assaulting students in my area. And with the article, she then sent a text that read, So, is this the guy who was following you? 
The article had a photo of the man that it was about, and it was indeed the creeper that had been following me that whole time. And it was also the one we'd been warned about via email. He didn't have the glasses on that he'd had when he was following me, which made me think it was some kind of disguise, seeing as he was apparently already banned from being near any student halls at the time that he'd been harassing me. The article explained how the creep had started following other girls from the exact same spot that he started following me, only they did what I didn't. They were polite. Of course, I'm absolutely not blaming them for that. I was just really fortunate to have it drummed into me by a protective dad and an equally overprotective older brother. Screw politeness. It's better to be accidentally rude to somebody with good intentions than to give the benefit of the doubt to an absolute psycho. So when he plied them with question after question and they'd warily answered, he'd always ask them, where are you going? And whatever they responded with, he'd then tell them, no, you're coming with me, and make a grab for them, assaulting some of them. And you want to know the worst part of all this? He got no jail time. He was given a curfew demanding that he'd be home before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. And I'd also like to add that in the same article, the police officer who hadn't been fit to bother calling me back about my report actually congratulated himself and his team for how well they handled the whole thing. What a load of crap. I'm still really working through severe anxiety issues, especially when it comes to being out in public alone. I'm never living in that city again. I live in a small studio apartment. I like my place a lot, even though it has some details that always made me really nervous living here. The wall facing the street is basically just a giant window, and I also live on the second floor, so my window is very close to the streets below. The marquee looks very easily climbable and gives direct access to my window. Even though that makes me a little uncomfortable, nothing really ever happened, and it just stopped bothering me a couple of months after I moved in. That is, until last week. Last Monday, I woke up at around 2am to go get some water to drink. Since the kitchen is right next to the side of my front door, I could hear something coming from the corridor as I filled up a cup. It wasn't coming from another apartment or from the streets. The noise had that very specific reverberation from an empty corridor. I approached the door and could make out that the sound was actually some kind of trap beat playing on repeat. At first, I thought maybe that, that was just some drunk guy messing around with his phone before getting to his apartment. But after laying in bed again, I could still faintly hear the same beat coming from the corridor. It kept playing and playing until I fell asleep about an hour later. 7 a.m. rolls around and I'm woken up by someone ringing the doorbell. It was a cop. A bunch of them, actually. The landlord and some of my neighbors were also there. Even with the place really crowded, it was really hard to miss the trail of blood that went from the corridor window to the far end of the wall. The cop said that someone was leaving for work early in the morning when they came across the blood smears and then immediately called the police. He questioned me and the neighbors. The place was scrubbed and we went on with our lives, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Every single day, I always come home and walk over where the blood was, and I always wonder what the heck happened in the corridor that night. Now, I was a little bit uncomfortable living here before, but now I'm definitely really spooked out. I wonder if I'll ever figure out what happened. When I was in college, I lived in apartments that weren't on campus but still called student housing. I saw this guy around that I thought was pretty cute. His name was Kiefer. He knocked on my door one day and he said he was the maintenance man and that he needed to change our AC filters. I was making dinner for my roommate at the time and for myself and he commented that it smelled really good so I invited him in to stay for dinner. All went pretty normal as we watched a movie afterwards totally innocent. At about midnight or so, I kept telling him that I was really tired, trying to hint for him to leave. My roommate had already gone to bed, so it was just him and me now. After telling him to leave because I was going to bed, he kept trying to talk me out of it, saying that I should stay up longer. He just kept taking forever, trying to drag it out. When he was putting on his shoes, he then started crying that he had a cramp in both of his calves. 
He told me that he couldn't walk upstairs and that he didn't know what to do. I really wanted to go knock on his door to have his roommate come and get him, but I'm in a wheelchair and I couldn't go upstairs. We had an extra bedroom in our apartment that only had a bed in it and nothing else. He continued asking if he could sleep in the room and I kept telling him no. We argued for like 10 minutes about allowing him to sleep in the extra bedroom. I was so freaking exhausted I just went ahead and decided to let him. I locked my roommate's door and my door so that he at least couldn't come into our rooms. When I woke up the next morning, luckily he was gone and nothing was stolen. I honestly should have reported it to the apartment complex, but I wasn't really thinking. A couple of days later, I heard someone knock on my bedroom window in the middle of the night and I totally flipped out about it. It ended up being Kiefer, but obviously I didn't let him in. Then the next night, my roommate and I were in the living room, and then he came and knocked on our door. Ashley, my roommate, answered it, and he asked for me, and she said that I was asleep already. His response? No, I know she's not asleep. I looked inside y'all's window, so I know she's awake. Yeah, Kiefer was definitely a creep. So, for some backstory... I moved from a very small town to a relatively large city. It was for university and I was around 19 years old. Since I wouldn't be in the new city until around September, my soon-to-be roommate decided to look for a place for us to live in the fall. In mid-July, she finally found us a decently priced, newly renovated, close to everything apartment. It was on a pretty busy road in the city. Fast forward to September when it was time for me to move in. Myself and my parents get to the building, and it looks a bit disheveled from the front, and upon entering, the inside of the building was an absolute mess. Appliances in the hallways, plaster was running up and down the walls like a child had been giving the material to play with, and the flooring was missing in most places. Since the apartment was actually kind of nice, and since it was my first ever apartment away from home, I was absolutely thrilled to finally have a place of my own. Now, this apartment housed many students, as well as the landlord and the superintendent, so it seemed like a relatively safe place to live, right? Wrong. My roommate had the door buzzer hooked up to her phone so that when someone rang, her phone would ring and she had the option to let them in or not. About a week after school had started, I was home since I didn't really have class until later in the day, and my roommate was at work. She texted me to let me know that someone had tried to buzz into the apartment, and when she answered, all she heard on the other end was an unfamiliar voice practically screaming. Let me in. Let me in right now. Luckily, my roommate had the sense enough not to let them into the building. About ten minutes later, someone comes banging right on my door. Without saying anything, they just continued knocking for what felt like hours, although it was probably only about twenty minutes in reality. I stayed in my room the entire time with the door closed because I was absolutely so afraid of who might be standing outside my door. Eventually the knocking stopped and when I checked the peephole, the person was gone. I felt really relieved that I had avoided what seemed to be some kind of creep looking to get in my apartment for some reason that I really wasn't aware of. Nothing too strange happened again until about two weeks later. Again, I was home since I was sick and my roommate was at work. I should note that my roommate was a flight attendant for a small airline, and obviously she wouldn't have her phone if she was already in the air. As I recall, there was no one to buzz the door this time. So it's early morning and not too long after my roommate left for work, and someone came banging on my door. Of course, I didn't get up to answer it because I was still sick in bed, hoping that they would just go away. We weren't expecting anyone, no packages or friends. And besides, how would they get into the apartment if my roommate's phone didn't ring for the door buzzer? When I finally think whoever was knocking at the door is left, someone actually unlocks the door to my apartment and walks right in. I was mortified. I always sleep with my room door closed, so there was absolutely no way that they would have known someone was in there except by opening the door. Since my roommate was a flight attendant, I knew it wasn't her because her flight would have been gone by this time, so there was really no way she could even answer her phone since there's no service when they're up in the air. I was frantically texting her to let her know that someone was indeed in our apartment without our permission. 
Where we live, our landlord must give 24 hours notice before entering the property. As I lay in bed crying and shaking out of pure fear, the person seemed to have just walked around the living room area and then left again. As soon as I heard the front door shut, I ran and locked all of the locks and put across the chain that would keep anyone from getting in, even if they had a key. To this day, neither me or my roommate know if it was the same person or someone who had previously lived in the apartment. We have no idea who it could have been. We left that apartment building only a couple months after that and moved into a more friendly and seemingly safer neighborhood. Whenever I drive past that building now, I always get the creeps. I don't think that I'll ever forget what happened. In Michigan, there's a little place called Traverse City. It's a smallish, very esoteric, hippie kind of town. In this town, there's a bona fide abandoned mental institution, complete with an absolutely enormous deserted grounds and dilapidated buildings, an old rusty water tower, and a huge stone basin in the middle of the woods that could hold maybe about 50 people. You know, the works. This actually isn't the creepy part, believe it or not as nothing scary really happened there. It was actually quite the popular hangout for college kids to get stoned and whatnot. It's more of a small detail on just how strange this town is, and kind of a backstory. You see, when the mental ward shut down, the patients were basically let loose to their own devices, and many of them ended up as one of the many homeless people that just roamed the town, and some of them just ended up in the Whiting. The Whiting was the cheapest apartment in town, basically a month-to-month -month hotel. It really wasn't a bad place. There was a housekeeper that stopped by once a week to clean the place up. It wasn't falling apart or infested with pests or anything. It was technically a sort of halfway home years and years ago, and it had to be shut down when some man was found dead of heroin overdose on the front steps. It eventually reopened to the public again and some of the people who lived there previously had nowhere else to go and moved back in. At this point of the story, I was a really broke college kid. I got some really weird vibes from the place, but I was really short on money and I thought it would be an interesting experience to say the least. Well, I wasn't wrong. First of all, it looked like the architect had actually gleaned inspiration from The Shining. Long narrow hallways, some straight and some swooping around, some that started out normal and then got so narrow that you literally had to walk sideways to fit. There was painted over doors and doors that led to nowhere and tiny doll-sized doors in the hallway that never opened. There were a lot of creepy pictures of crying girls or off-putting abstract paintings decorating the walls. My friend lived in a small room that had a large mysterious X painted over his bed. He also had a painted over locked door to his left. And my other friend who lived on the second story at the end of the building had a window that looked out of a straight up brick wall. Pretty bizarre, right? Well, wait until you meet your neighbors. Schizophrenics and drugged out zombies wandered up and down the halls or peeked out of their doors before slamming it shut. You could just be walking along when the door would suddenly open and a battered looking woman would tell you that the other tenants were trying to hurt her and that she was going to be sleeping with a knife for protection. Another good friend of mine once opened her door and found an entire lamp taken apart piece by piece and then aligned on her doorstep. There's a few incidents that really stick out in my mind. Once I went to the shattered kitchen to make myself lasagna. One of the women was already there and she was sitting in a kitchen chair just talking to herself in a high-pitched girly voice. Now, this woman was a big and rather imposing individual, made all the more intimidating because she had a habit of ramming people in the shoulder whenever she passed them in the halls. She's just sitting there and mocking and insulting me the entire time, but all to herself as if I can't hear her all while eyeing me with a sideways, dead-eyed kind of look. Every now and then, she gives a high-pitched giggle that sounded truly sinister. Well, I then say, Uh, everything all right? And she's muttering to herself, The thing's talking to me. I won't respond. And then she giggles. I'm definitely perplexed at this point. I pick up a fork and I'm getting ready to exit, and she then starts really flipping out and starts rapidly saying, you got a fork? You gonna kill me with that? You gonna stab me in the throat and murder my family with that fork? Yes, she was actually screaming by the end of it. I didn't stick around. I could still hear her screaming whenever I would take my crap out of the door, 
going on about hurting her. And just like some movie, I can hear high-pitched hysterical laughter echoing down the halls as she gets louder and louder. Truly brought goosebumps up to my arms, I can tell you that. Another time, a man was so messed up on some substances that he could hardly stand and he tried to chase me. He was at the foot of the stairs and I had to pass him and he tried to slur some nonsense at me while I walked by him. I think he said something about a shower. Well, he reaches out and grabs my arm and then tries pulling me toward him. I pull away so fast that he gets knocked over and as I'm running up the stairs, he's trying to collect himself and stand back up. I hide in my friend's room and we can hear him slouching and banging up the stairs, just calling for me in a doped up sort of way. About a week later, he apparently forgets about it and I see him in the lobby. He had asked me which room I lived in. So yeah, that's a brief summary of the really creepy place that I lived in at one point. It was definitely an interesting and creepy experience to say the least. Thank you for reading my story. I must start by saying this story falls about average or maybe even below average on the scary meter. But it was such a strange event that I found it discussion worthy. So maybe some of you will rate it high on that strange meter and maybe some of you will just think it's lame. I lived in the third house at the end of a dead end road just on the outside of a small town in Ohio. Many strange and dark things happened there. Maybe I will share those stories some other time. But one night, I was left perplexed by something I saw from my bedroom window. This old house did not have central air. Although I had a window unit in my bedroom, I'd like to shut it off and open the windows on cool, breezy nights. I loved listening to the sounds of nature. Surrounding the dead-end road were many miles of woods where I would see coyotes, raccoons, possum, and deer. These were everyday sightings. There were many times throughout many nights where the woods would go silent. I think most of you know when the woods go silent there is likely a predator of some kind nearby. One night I have my windows open. It's after midnight sometime and I'm just browsing Pinterest on my phone when the woods go silent. It seemed like it was five minutes or so before I noticed how long everything had been silent. You could even hear a pin drop. Normally, when the woods go silent, it was never for more than a couple of minutes. Being curious and wondering if coyotes were sniffing around my front porch again, I got up and looked out my bedroom window that faces the front of the house. Now, at this time, I can't remember if I had started listening to these kind of podcasts or not, so I'm not sure if I had ever heard the stories of wendigos or not-deer creatures. Listening to one of the Swamp Dweller podcast shows made me remember this event and realized what I saw may have been one of these creatures. For context, the road at the front of my house was paved and went straight until it wide off into our driveway to the left and the other portion went straight ahead to the right and wide turned into a dirt and gravel road. Then I looked out the window. Everything was silent and I was surprised to see what appeared to be a very large and lonely buck walking down the middle of the road towards the dirt road and straight ahead. I watched for it, finding it strange that it was all alone. Normally when you see one deer, there are at least a few close by. As I watched it walking towards the dirt road, I thought it looked strange. First off, I'll be honest, I'm no hunter, but this buck looked massive. Two or three times larger than what might be considered average. Not only was it large, but the way it walked, like it was being worked like a string puppet or like it was in a trance, or maybe even how a soldier would march. It never turned and looked at me. I never made a sound. I just stood there, rubbing my eyes trying to figure out what the heck I was seeing. I was 100% sober during this, just a heads up. Before it reached the point where I couldn't be able to see it from my window, I looked around. I'm not sure why. Maybe I was trying to see any other deer to rationalize what this was. This was only for a second, and when I looked back, 
it was gone. There was no way it could have left my line of sight so quickly. That's when I, that's when I realized I never heard its footsteps. It never made a sound. Just the woods came back to life right then and there, and I almost jumped out of my skin from being so spooked. I just stood at my window, feeling bewildered. What the hell did I just see? Whatever it was, was definitely not a deer. This thing made the forest, which was usually very loud at night, go dead quiet. The way it walked, its size, how it just disappeared. The whole situation was just so bizarre. I thought about telling my roommate what I saw, but he was not a sensitive person and not a big believer in the unknown or the paranormal. Although a year or two later, when the house was being renovated, he started to believe. But hey, that's another story entirely. So there it is, my potential not dear sighting. Like I said, it's not the scariest story, but it's a head-scratcher. Do any of you have a similar story? Can anyone tell me what they think I saw, or what they think the not deer was doing marching down the road just to disappear? I feel like if I had made a sound or engaged with it, the situation may have escalated. I was always under the impression that there might be a portal on the property for spirits or unknown things to come and go through. Is that what the not deer was doing? Just taking the portal back to hell for a dinner engagement with Satan? This story takes place in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. For those who are not aware, the Appalachian Mountain Range is approximately 480 million years old, and I've always wondered, while hiking in the park, about what kind of animals once roamed the hills we hike today. In the summertime, the dense vegetation and the abundant rhododendrons can take you back to a prehistoric age when the dinosaurs would have foraged among the same hills that hikers now casually walk, basking in the unparalleled beauty that is the Smokies. This event happened in late December, when the leaves fall off the deciduous trees, opening the hills to your eyes, allowing you to see the contours of the land as you hike. Me and my girlfriend were staying in the small town of Weir's Valley, which is approximately 45 minutes west of the bustling tourist trap of Gatlinburg. We'd stayed in Gatlinburg in years past and decided that this year we wanted a small cabin, far from the normal hustle and bustle of the late December tourist rush. Many of the locals spitefully call this period from Christmas to New Year's Hell Week. Knowing this, we decided to stop at a small hiking store and inquired about a day hike that would take us far into the backcountry. They pulled out a map detailing the western end of the park and showed us multiple trails that would fit our description. We ended up settling on a trail that was about four miles one way, with a massive waterfall as the reward at the end of the trail. We arrived at the trailhead at about 9 in the morning, and there was only about one car there already. Perfect. It was an elderly couple getting their packs ready for their hike, and we were excited at the lack of hikers. As our goal for the day was to try and not see a human being for the entire hike, the first half of the hike was entirely uneventful. We reached the waterfall after about two hours or so, and sat down and took a lunch break before departing back towards the trailhead. Before I continue the story, I want to make a note that we had not seen a single person the entire hike so far. We had not even seen so much as a plane flying overhead. That's why we turned the corner on the trail, and we froze in our places. There was a girl walking alone about 50 yards ahead of us. Now, normally it's not uncommon to see people hiking alone, but they typically look the part. They usually have a hiking pack, hiking shoes, and they'll almost always acknowledge you and ask you how your day is before you go in your separate ways. N not this girl. First and foremost, she did not look like she belonged out there. She looked like she was about 15 or 16 years old, and she did not have a bag or any water. She was about 15 or 16 wearing tennis shoes, which was odd considering that this rugged trail demanded heavy hiking boots. We were shocked to see her out this far by herself, and we were even more disturbed that we didn't see her before turning the corner on the trail. She essentially appeared out of nowhere. After me and my girlfriend exchanged concerned looks, we decided to continue down the trail as normal, 
as we didn't want this girl to turn around and see us just standing there and spook her. We made ourselves known as best as we could by kicking rocks with our boots and talking to each other. This girl didn't turn around and acknowledge us or even respond to us one time, even when we said hello. After about 50 yards of following her at a distance, we reached a creek crossing with a rudimentary path of dry rocks as the only way to cross. She put her arms out to balance herself, and we both noticed that when she put her arms up, it didn't look right. Unless you had terrible balance, there was no reason to balance yourself on this little creek crossing. Calling it a creek is almost giving it too much credit, as it was more like a gentle stream coming off the hill that crossed the trail and flowed to the river below. The water at its deepest was no more than six inches, and if you had halfway decent hiking boots, you could simply walk through the water without getting your feet wet. Wanting to be considerate of our fellow hiker, we decided to wait behind her as she arduously crossed the creek. She took way more time than she needed to cross and it felt like she was deliberately walking slow to creep us out. We crossed the creek in about 30 seconds time after watching her take two or three minutes. Keep in mind, this creek was maybe 15 feet long at that and as I mentioned, maybe six inches deep. I decided to cross before my girlfriend because I had a nauseating feeling in the pit of my stomach about the entire situation and I wanted to put something between her and my girlfriend. Because I had my eyes glued on this girl, I wasn't paying attention to where I was walking, and my foot slipped from the rock and fell into the water, making a very loud splash. Even though this girl was less than 20 feet ahead of us, she still did not turn around and acknowledge us. After me and my girlfriend crossed the creek, we could see that shortly ahead were a set of switchbacks going down the mountain. We decided to stop and put some distance between us and the girl. She was walking at an incredibly slow pace, and we waited for a couple of minutes before we saw that she had gone around the corner down the first switchback. Me and my girlfriend had a brief conversation about what the heck just happened, and we collected ourselves and continued down the trail. We didn't think anything much of it, we just tried to continue going without being unnerved any further. We thought that was the case, and so when we turned down the first switchback and saw something terrible... Well, we saw nothing at all. The girl had vanished, unless she took off at a sprint as soon as she turned the corner. We should have seen her. The switchback was very gradual, and we could clearly see the next five or six switchbacks below us. The leaves were gone off the trees, allowing us to see every foot of the trail below. Even if she started running, we would have heard her. The main river was about 500 feet below us, and the rushing water was barely audible from where we were standing. She either vanished, hid behind a tree from us, or somehow managed to sprint a quarter mile down the mountain in complete silence away from us. We had absolutely no idea what to think, so we once again stopped to collect ourselves. We were terrified and were not sure whether to go back up the mountain or continue down as planned. After a hurried deliberation, we decided to proceed down the trail as normal. We never saw her. As we reached the trailhead, we ran into a group of hikers and we figured we'd ask them if they saw a teenage girl hiking along without a backpack. They gave us a strange look and said we were the first people they'd seen on the trail all day. We simply thanked them and continued as to not scare them. I've always heard of paranormal things happening in the Smokies, from Bigfoot to Skimwalkers to a group of wild mountain people living primitively within the park. I've always entertained these stories because who doesn't love a good ghost story? I've never anticipated having an encounter of my own in the woods. The scariest thing to me about the encounter all these years later though, is that we never saw her face. I love to adventure. I've been to almost all 50 states. I've seen my fair share of diversity within nature and people. My main reason for travel is to explore the wilderness. Sometimes I will backpack in the Rocky Mountains, drive through national parks, and then drive through the desert. Growing up on the East Coast, I didn't get to experience the desert much, so I tend to favor the desert drive over the mountainous drive. I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I haven't experienced anything too odd in the desert other than the sheer feeling of loneliness. My favorite time to drive through the desert is at night because the stars majestically illuminate the terrain. 
About a month ago, however, I saw more than just sand and stars on this particular drive. I was driving through the desert in Arizona. Nightfall was closing in on me, which was one of the best times. The sunset across the desert brought me to a whole new place. Sometimes I would even camp out in my car, because in a sense, I loved how alone I was out there. Normally I would bring my dog with me, but my parents were in town, so I was all alone this time. Again, with nightfall approaching, I didn't know whether I should camp out or keep driving home. I figured my parents would want to see me, and I was only about an hour from the house, so I continued through the quickly darkening desert. If any of you have ever been through the desert in Arizona, you would know that you occasionally see horses and other animals along the side of the road. So seeing figures on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere isn't anything out of the ordinary. About 45 minutes from my house, my high beams pick up on a different figure. It looked like... a person. Being the generous person that I am, I pulled over to see if anything was wrong. As I approached, I noticed the person wasn't moving. At all. They were just sitting upright. They didn't seem to notice that I was even there. His head never turned. Are you okay? There was no answer. No acknowledgement that I had said anything. The man was poorly dressed. Rather pale, but surprisingly clean-shaven. He was oddly skinny, though. And the more I focused on him, the more I realized how abnormally skinny he was. I, uh was driving by and noticed you. I wanted to make sure that you were okay. Still nothing. He was staring straight at the ground. I sat there awkwardly for a couple of seconds, until I finally saw his jaw move. I need some water. His voice was deep. It didn't sound like a person. I can't quite explain it, but his voice just sounded... off. Okay, man. Let me grab you some out of my car. I walked to the passenger door and reached for my bottle of water. Before I could even reach it though, I just sensed that something was off. I jolted my head where the man was sitting. He was gone. I was now panicking. I didn't know where he went to. I closed the passenger door and took a quick look around. I heard movement from behind a rock about 10 to 20 feet off the road. A man came out from behind the rock, but it was not the same man. This guy looked absolutely nuts, and he was holding something in his hand. He started running towards me. I then jumped into my car and took off down the road. As I looked into my rearview mirror, I realized that there was more of them, maybe five or six all emerging from behind the rocks right off the road. They were all staring at me as I sped off. I had no intention of slowing down. In fact, I would have been happy if I got pulled over by a cop. Within three to four minutes of that happening, I felt relaxed enough to play some music. I took one last glance into my rearview mirror. My blood then turned to ice. I was in complete shock when I saw the man who I had offered the water to sitting in my back seat, just staring at me. His eyes. They weren't looking at me. They were looking into me. I of course then slammed on my brakes, still in too much shock to make any noise. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. He then started to smile. The look of death was on his face. Soon, you will be one of us. He stated as he lifted up his knife. I jolted out of my car, and as soon as I did, I could hear my back door opening up. This man was very fast, inhumanly fast, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to outrun him for long. Are you ready? The deep voice said as he quickly approached me. It was now completely dark out. I had no clue where to go. It was over, or so I thought. There were headlights approaching us. At this point, I was a couple hundred feet from my car. I didn't hear the man behind me anymore. I waved down the car that was approaching me. Thank God the driver saw me and stopped. After explaining to the man what happened, he tried calling the police, but sadly, there was no signal. 
His name was Mark, and he agreed to follow me home just in case anything else happened. He also had a pistol on him, which really made me feel safe. After about 35 minutes of driving with Mark behind me the whole way, I finally made it back home. After thanking him, I went to go check the back seat of the car to see if my stuff was still there, or if the man had left anything. Luckily, everything was still there. I did, however, notice a sheet of paper on the top of my backpack. I took it and opened it up. You aren't safe. You will soon be one of us. The note read. A chill ran through my body. I was startled by the sound of footsteps in front of my car and jolted up. The dog threw up, my mom said, standing right in front of my car. I went back inside. I didn't say anything to my parents. They probably wouldn't have believed me anyway. I figured that I would call the police and let them know what happened after they left. Oh yeah, some guy stopped by looking for you about 20 minutes ago. Uh, who? I asked. I don't know, it was some skinny guy with a really deep voice. He didn't talk much, but he did give me this letter to give to you, so here. But try to find more normal friends, please. My heart was racing. As soon as my parents left, I opened it. We know where you live. The letter read. My heart sank. After calling the cops and explaining everything, they investigated it for a while. But sadly, they found no sign of people along the section of road I was on. I gave them the letter for DNA testing, but I still haven't heard anything back. I installed the security system to my house and haven't had any problems since. And I hope to God, it stays that way. There is a single stretch of I-70 in Utah between Salina and Green River. Over 100 miles with no services, no hotels, no restaurants or gas stations of any kind. There are only some viewing areas where you can pull off the road. It's a hell of a drive, and don't get me wrong. Those Utah mountains are stunning in the daytime, and at night, you have one of the clearest views of the stars you can find. But 100 miles is a long way to go, especially at night. Anyone who has driven that stretch of interstate can tell you, it's not very busy, even during the day. Approaching dusk, traffic becomes even more scarce, and by the time the middle of the night rolls around, you can drive for miles and miles and not see headlights from another car. And don't even get me started on cell service out there. Definitely not a place you want to be stuck in, especially at night. The thought of breaking down out there on a dark night when no one around for miles is enough to give anyone second thoughts about attempting the drive. Unfortunately for me, I was in a hurry, so I decided to go for it. A little backstory. I'm originally from a city called Lincoln in Nebraska, mostly known for the college sports team, the Cornhuskers. I was born and raised there. I lived there up until I was about 25, and then I decided that since I was single, with no kids, that now was the time to get out there and explore, so I accepted a job in LA and moved out west. Most of my family still lives in Lincoln, so I try to go back and visit every once in a while. This particular Sunday I got a call from my mom around 2pm. My grandpa, who had been in a nursing home since he had a stroke, was getting a lot worse. They didn't expect him to make it to the end of the week, so if I wanted to go and see him, I should do so sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, I was out of a job, but this meant that I had the time to go and see him. Last minute flights can be rather expensive, so I decided to drive. I had made the drive before, it certainly wasn't fun, but it was a much cheaper option, and I figured I should try and drive all the way through. And luckily for me, I had gotten my car serviced a couple of weeks prior. Two hours later, I was packed up and on the road with my dog, Chance. It was a pretty uneventful drive for the most part. Daylight faded, and I remember being disappointed that I would be driving through Utah and most of Colorado at night, and I would miss out on the beautiful scenery. 
I love looking at the stars, but it's hard to enjoy them when you're driving 80 miles per hour. And since I was in a hurry, I wouldn't be stopping to get a better look. So I resigned myself to just singing loudly to keep myself awake. <laughs> We've all been there, right? A little after midnight, I finally got to Selena, Utah. I passed the billboard that warned motorists of what's to come. No service for 110 miles. It's paid for by the city of Selena, and it's a good thing too. According to the gas station attendants, several times each week someone comes walking up to the building because they ran out of gas. So I stopped and filled up, and was immediately back on the road. It had snowed recently. The roads were clear, but there was still snow shoveled off to the sides. Now, I'm the kind of driver that speeds everywhere I go. The speed limit on this particular stretch of road is usually around 80 miles per hour, so I'm typically going about 90, except on the steep grades, which there are plenty. I've been driving about 30 minutes at this point. I had passed a few cars several miles back, but they're too far gone to even see their headlights. Have you ever driven on a road alone late at night and just marveled at how dark it actually is? and how alone you actually are. Sometimes when I'm on a drive like that and I get to a long stretch of road, I like to turn my headlights off as I'm driving, just for a few seconds, just to see how it really looks when there's almost no light around. It's almost cathartic. Suddenly as I'm driving, I hear a loud pop and the car jerks right, or maybe it was left. I can't remember. My low tire pressure indicator is flashing and I slam on the brakes after I straighten out the car. I pull over to the side of the road and put on my emergency lights. Chance is going nuts. I've blown out a tire before, so I already know what to expect as I step out of the car. My right front tire is completely flat, and I tried to examine the tire more closely to see what actually happened, but even with the flashlight on my iPhone, it's still too dark to see. I check my phone, and of course, there's no cell service. I roll down the rear passenger window so Chance can stick his head out and get some fresh air while I replace the tire. I get to work, grumbling under my breath that of course I'm just about halfway to Green River and I'll have to go the rest of the way on my spare tire, which would significantly slow me down. I remove the spare tire and the jack from the trunk and went to go get started. As I made my way back up to the front of my car, I froze. Someone was walking towards me their silhouette barely visible at the very edge of my headlights. Chance didn't make a sound. They continued walking until they were about 30 feet away from my car. I couldn't make out any distinct features. They were just tall. 6'5", maybe 6'6". Six, six. At this point, no cars had passed me going east since I had pulled over. So after the initial shock of seeing another person, my first thought was, where did this person come from? They just stood there, unmoving, staring at us. Chan still didn't make a sound, but he was now staring at the figure ahead like I was. I won't lie, I was scared shitless. Who was this person? Where did they come from? And why were they just staring at me? Why isn't Chan barking at them like he does everything else that moves? I put down my spare tire and hesitantly asked, Hello? I was still hoping that my eyes were playing tricks on me. No response. They didn't move a muscle. It was under 10 degrees and they weren't even shivering. Hello? I asked again, a little louder this time. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if this person requires assistance more than I do. I open my mouth to speak again, when I finally hear something. Do you need help? The man faintly asked me. For the first time, I can tell that it was a man, based on his voice. It wasn't as deep as you might expect from a man his size, which striked me as odd, but he still hadn't moved. Where did you come from? I asked. I didn't see any taillights in front of me, and no one has passed me since I pulled over. How long have you been out here? I started walking towards the front of my car slowly. The tire iron clenched firmly in my hand. The man made no visible movements, but again he said, Do you need help? I stopped walking and tried to get a better look. I couldn't make out any physical features, but I could tell he wasn't dressed for winter. 
I was in sweatpants, a winter jacket, and was still freezing. But here is this man wearing a short sleeve shirt. He kept his face pointing down the whole time. At this point, I'm really starting to freak out. Do you need help? This time, his voice sounded all wrong, as if he was struggling with each word. I started inching my way around the front of my car, to the driver's side door. If nothing else, I could get in my car and lock the doors. I still had my tire iron, but I never thought of myself as a physically impressive person, and I knew that if it came down to it, this tire iron may not help me overcome the difference in stature. He spoke again. Do you need help? Do you need help? Do you need help? His voice becoming more urgent. He finally takes a step towards me, still repeating. Do you need help? Do you need help? He was speaking faster. I quickly moved around the car and found the driver's door handle. Just as I'm about to pull it open, a light appears behind me. I instinctively turn around to see a pair of headlights coming my way down the interstate. Chan starts barking loud. I whip back around, expecting to see the man closing in on me. But he was gone. Chance was still barking. Hello? I yell out, but there was nothing. No breathing, no movement, no response. I stood there for a couple of seconds, unsure of what was happening. The car coming down the highway passes me. They don't stop. I can't blame them. Would you stop for a random car on the side of a desolate road? I didn't even think about waving them down. I was still trying to process what happened. Did I imagine that whole thing? I walk ahead, approaching the area where the man was standing. There was footprints in the snow. They began where the man was standing, stretching into the distance down the road. I still held my tire iron. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and followed the footsteps. They went for about 10 feet, then turned. They went right off the road to the south and disappear. Now I'm not stupid enough to go following footsteps through the Utah wilderness in the middle of the night, but damn it, I was curious. More headlights coming up from behind me brought me back to my senses. I went back to my car, changed the tire, and was back on my way, albeit at a much slower pace. The rest of the trip was as uneventful as the beginning, and I didn't feel the need to mention the encounter to anyone. Sure, it was freaky, but I still wasn't altogether convinced that I didn't imagine the whole thing. It was late, and I had been driving for almost 9 hours straight. But I will tell you one thing for sure, I definitely don't want to drive that way again to find out. So my trucking route is from here in Connecticut all the way down to Kentucky and Tennessee. It's a pretty good run, I get to see pretty much all the sights the east coast has to offer but there's one area of the country that gets pretty wild and that's the area around the Appalachian Mountains. You guys probably know that it's one of the poorest areas of the country, one that got really screwed over as the coal mining jobs started to dwindle and the local economy went down the pooper. I really feel for the people down there, seeing how entrenched in poverty some of the families are is just heartbreaking. So I was rolling through an area of the state that I hadn't previously been through, thanks to my usual section of highway being blocked off by some huge traffic accident that had unfortunately left a few people dead. It was having some trouble navigating the roads after my phone ran out of battery and, wouldn't you know it, the plug charger decides to give out too. Worst timing ever. But I was an experienced truck driver and I wasn't driving on an 18-wheeler on that particular run so I was free to take some of the smaller roads to find my way around, but despite the fact that I consider myself pretty good on the roads, there was a point that I found myself hopelessly lost and I started to worry that I wouldn't make my shipping delivery deadline. That would mean disciplinary proceedings and whatnot and I just couldn't afford those at all. Anyway. I happen to see this one guy wandering down the side of the road, so I slow my truck, wind down the window, and ask him for directions. The guy seems friendly enough and is more than willing to take a few minutes to give me all the information I need on how to make it back onto the main highways that headed south. 
but then I start asking him if there's anywhere nearby that I'd be able to get some lunch, as it was getting towards one in the afternoon and I'd only managed to get myself a pretty meager breakfast. The guy seems to think for a minute, scratching his head, taking an unusually long time to think of an answer to a question that usually takes like seconds to answer. It's rare to be anywhere in West Virginia where there isn't a Cracker Barrel within a few miles, so why he didn't just point me in the direction of one of those was beyond me. When I pressed him, he told me he knew of an old family-run place that did the best chicken fried steak in the entire county, maybe even the state. Suddenly, all was forgiven. I might be a northerner, but I'll be darned if I turned down a good chicken fried steak. All that was taking so long was for him to try and remember the best way there that wouldn't take me down some run-down old dirt road, one which might get my truck stuck on it, which really would have left me screwed. So after a minute, he gives me some pretty detailed directions towards an old strip mall. He told me it was mostly abandoned, but that that restaurant was still there, along with a few other small businesses, and not to pay any mind if the place seemed quiet during lunch, as it did the majority of its business in the early to late evening. I was happy enough, thanked the guy, then set off following the directions he'd given me. It took me a little while to find the old strip mall the guy was talking about. It was honestly a little frustrating to drive past a couple of chain restaurants and whatnot, given that I was so hungry. But man, if I wasn't craving some of that country-style chicken fried steak, and if it was a family-run place, then all the better. That chain restaurant stuff just doesn't cut it compared to a real home-style cooking. But eventually I actually find this run-down old strip mall the guy seemed to be talking about, and it was little wonder the place was in such a state of disrepair. It was way off any highway. There was absolutely no signage for it, literally nothing to let anyone know it was there. But even worse, I saw zero indication that there was any kind of restaurant open in any of the units. I wasn't about to give up so easily though, as I did see one place that had a big old sign over it saying something like Mama J's Country Kitchen or some variation on that, so my hopes were restored. That's when I see a guy open up the door of the place, stepping out into the afternoon heat and staring over at my truck. I gave him away from the driver's side, overjoyed that I was finally about to get some decent food on what had been a long, lonely drive from Connecticut. I figured he hadn't seen me do it, that the sun was obscuring his vision or something just because he continued to stare back at me. Anyway, I get out of my truck, lock the doors, and start walking over to the restaurant. I call out to the guy like halfway across the parking lot asking if they were indeed open for business. Again, the guy doesn't react. He just keeps staring at me in a way that I now notice is distinctly unwelcoming. Something in my gut just told me to stop walking. I had this creeping feeling all over my body like something was telling me that something was horribly wrong with this whole setup. And no sooner had I started feeling distinctly vulnerable than the guy reached behind his back pulls something out of his back pocket, and puts it on his head. I thought it was like a woolly hat at first, but then he pulls it down. It's like a balaclava. Then I notice something else in his hand, a small revolver. I turn and start running back towards the truck, and as I do, I see a few other guys emerging from the derelict units, each running towards my truck to try and cut me off. Each had some kind of weapon in their hand be it a knife or an iron bar, and seeing those just made me run even faster. Thank God I'd gotten that gut feeling when I did, otherwise they'd have definitely made it to my truck before I did. I threw the door open, jumped inside, and locked the cab behind me, trembling as I rummaged in my pocket for the keys. The bandits surrounded the cab of my truck, hitting the chassis with their weapons and demanding I get out. Then the guy with the gun aimed that thing right at my face through the windshield, screaming for me to get out of the truck. I had no choice but to do what I did. I gunned the engine and plowed the whole bunch of them, knocking down those that didn't jump out of the way in time. I leaned down in my seat as I gripped the wheel out of pure instinct really and again, I thank God that I did, because when I hit the guy with the gun, he let loose a single shot that shattered the windshield and struck the seat just above my head. I circled around the parking lot expecting the next shot to come at any moment, but only the bandits that had gotten out of the way of my initial truck charge were chasing me. Two or three were just lying on the concrete, 
rolling around in pain whilst holding onto their limbs. I think that's about the only thing that saved me, having the presence of mind to just ram them instead of trying to reverse out of there. If that had been my choice, I might not be around to tell you all this. I got out of that parking lot, speeding off blindly in the first direction I could, until I found somewhere to safely park up and call the cops. The sheriff's deputy I spoke to told me to swing on by the department when I was next able to so I could give a statement and I did so, but not until I actually managed to get myself some lunch as not even the terror of almost getting hijacked could dull my appetite. I guess that makes me sound pretty fat or whatever, but you guys need to appreciate just how hungry I was. Down at the department, however, I learned that I was not the first truck driver to have run into these bandits, how I'd been just unlucky enough to ask directions from one of their kinfolk who had directed me to the rundown strip mall just before calling his buddies to let them know I'd be there. At least, that's the only conclusion we came to once I described the guy I'd asked directions from. The deputy just seemed to nod knowingly when I related this guy's physical description. I guess I'm just warning you guys to be very, very careful when you're out on the roads. And although it seems like some tired old cautionary tale from your Facebook posting aunt, be careful when you're talking to strangers. There's no way of knowing just who they really are.